Elder Emilio Nos of Simonopetra, The Mystical Marriage, Spiritual Life According to St. Maximus the Confessor, translated by the very Reverend Archimandrite Maximus Constance, New Rome Press, Columbia, Missouri, 2018. Contents, Introduction, Preamble, Chapter 1, He Who Genuinely Loves God Prays Entirely Without Distraction, Chapter 2. When the passions dominate the mind, they bind it to material things. Chapter 3. The one who throws off self-love, which is the mother of the passions, will very easily, with God's help, set aside the others. Chapter 4. The life of the faithful should be filled with joy and gladness. Chapter 5. All the words of the Lord contain these four, commandments, dogmas, threats, and promises. Chapter 6. The mind that has succeeded in the life of ascetic practice advances in prudence. Followed by the index. Dedication. For Archimandrite Elizaios, abbot of the holy monastery of Simonopetra, Manathos, with deepest respect and appreciation. Introduction. If it is true that we live in an adulterous and sinful generation, Matthew 16, 4, it is equally true that where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, Romans 5, 20. And thus God has blessed our generation with extraordinary saints and teachers, among whom Elder Emilio Nos of Simonopetra holds a special place. Born in Piraeus, Greece in 1934, he was tonsured a monk in 1960, and ordained to the diaconate and priesthood in 1961. Later in the same year, he was elevated to the position of abbot of the Holy Monastery of the Transfiguration at Meteora, the second largest monastic community in Greece after Mount Athos. In 1973, he and his monastic disciples were invited to repopulate the Holy Monastery of Simonopetra on Mount Athos, where the elder was officially enthroned as abbot on December 17th 1974. There, he and his brotherhood played a significant role in the modern revival of monastic life on the Holy Mountain. The revival was marked not only by renewed interest in traditional Orthodox monastic life, but also by renewed interest in the writings of the Church Fathers, of which the present volume, a series of talks on select passages from St. Maximus the Confessor's celebrated work, The Chapters on Love, is an outstanding example this was not the first time that the writings of St. Maximus the Confessor or of the Church Fathers more generally had come to prominence on the Holy Mountain. The Philokalic movement of the 18th century witnessed a similar revival and resulted in the publication of the Philokalia, a collection of Orthodox ascetical and spiritual writings compiled from the works of nearly 40 Church Fathers ranging in date from the 4th through the 15th century. Published in Venice in 1782, the Philokalia was soon translated into Slavonic in Moscow in 1793 and popularized through the beloved 19th century classic, The Way of a Pilgrim. The Philokalia is now recognized as a definitive expression of the ascetic and spiritual tradition of the Orthodox Church, with particular emphasis on the practice of the Jesus Prayer, and is without question the most important book published by if not actually on Manathos. One of the Philokalia's principal editors, St. Nicodemus, who lived from 1749 to 1809, was deeply immersed in the patristic tradition and undertook extensive research in the libraries of Manathos, reading, studying, copying, and compiling the writings of the great church fathers. In addition to his work on the Philokalia, he published the works of St. Simeon the New Theologian, the letters of Saints Barsanufius and John, the multi-volume Evangetinos, the exegetical writings of Theophylactos of Ucrid, which are largely based on the homilies of St. John Chrysostom, and compiled what would have been the first edition of the collected works of St. Gregory Palamas. St. Nicodemus' greatest devotion, however, was reserved for St. Maximus the Confessor, whom he cites or alludes to hundreds of times, and to whom he granted more space than any other writer in the Philokalia. Moreover, St. Nicodemus's introduction to the Philokalia is imbued with the theology of St. Maximus, 
who is directly mentioned in the introduction's opening paragraphs. In addition to his general introduction to the Philokalia, St. Nicodemus also wrote a short introduction to the writings of St. Maximus in which he describes in language influenced by the Gospel of John the inspired nature and transformative power of St. Maximus's works. Quote, Maximus the Confessor drank deeply from the fount of wisdom and was continually watered by the life-giving streams of the sacred scriptures. This is why rivers of divine teachings pour forth from his soul, watering all creation. Through these chapters, we too may drink from the sweet water that rises souls from the dead, and we are making them available to all those who have a genuine thirst for divine wisdom, so that by drinking deeply from his words, they will never thirst again. See John chapter 4, verse 14. To continue, St. Maximus's extraordinary importance for the Orthodox spiritual tradition indicated by his prominence in the Philokalia is due to the fact that through his systematic correction of the theological errors of Origen and Evagrius, he established Orthodox spirituality on its proper philosophical, anthropological, and theological foundations. One can therefore rightly say that the predominant influence of the, on the Philokalia is the spiritual synthesis articulated by St. Maximus the Confessor, who deftly wove together diverse ascetical anthropologies and theologies into a doctrinally consistent unity, which was faithful to the witness of the New Testament, the mind of the Fathers, and the theology of the ecumenical councils. Like the philokalic movement of the 18th century, the modern Athenite revival has been also characterized by a revival of interest in the writings of St. Maximus the Confessor and of the Church Fathers more generally. This should not surprise us, since there has never been genuine renewal or growth in the Church that was not also a return to the Fathers. We should therefore be wary of movements in the Church which ignore the Fathers or which deliberately reject or marginalize them. In the words of St. Gregory Palamas, quote, How could one who does not follow the teachings of the fathers be trustworthy? And how would such a person not reject the God of the fathers and the saints? For the Lord said, he who rejects you rejects me, Luke ten sixteen. That is, he rejects the truth itself. And how could someone who is opposed to the truth be acceptable to those who are seeking the truth? To continue, appropriately then, the 600th anniversary of the death of St. Gregory Palamas on November 14th, 1359, provided the impetus for the publication of the saint's collected works, the first volume of which appeared in 1962. The timing was auspicious, since it coincided with the 1000th anniversary of the Holy Mountain in 1963. This was a project of major importance and of potentially monumental significance for Orthodox theology. However, its influence outside the Greek-speaking world has been rather minimal. To this day, the majority of St. Gregory's works remain untranslated and neglected by Orthodox theologians and students of theology, especially in North America. For example, we continue to lack a complete English translation of Palamas's triads, which is essential for understanding the basic elements of his theology. Closer to the example of Elder Emilianos was the devotion of Elder, now St. Paisios, to the writings of St. Isaac the Syrian, who lived in the 7th century and was a younger contemporary of St. Maximus the Confessor. The ascetical homilies of St. Isaac were among Elder Paisios's beloved daily readings, and he urged his spiritual children to study them closely. Elder Paisios' devotion to St. Isaac the Syrian was transmitted to his disciple, Archimandrite Vasilios Grandikakis, who became the abbot of the Holy Monastery of Stavronikita and later of the Holy Monastery of Ivoron, where he currently lives in retirement. From the very beginning of his monastic life at Stravnorokita, 1968, Archimandrite Vasilios was deeply impressed by what he describes as a spiritual miracle called St. Isaac, and his love for the saint is evident in virtually all his writings. He was, however, dissatisfied with the existing Greek text, originally published by Nikiforos Theotokis in Leipzig in 1770, which 
contained significant errors and in 1970 embarked on an effort to collect the major Greek manuscripts and produce a new critical edition. The project became increasingly complex and time-consuming and in 2000 was turned over to Marcel Piron, who in 2012 published a magnificent critical edition of the ascetical homilies of St. Isaac the Syrian. The original Greek translation of the homilies was produced in the late 8th or early 9th century at the monastery of St. Savas in Palestine by two monks, Patrikikos and Avram, and is one of the earliest surviving witnesses to the ascetical homilies. While Archimandrite Vasilios was working on the ascetical homilies of St. Isaac the Syrian, another learned Athenite monk, Father Theoclitos Dionysiatis, who reposed in 2006, was working on a modern Greek translation of St. Maximus the Confessor's chapters on love. An outstanding writer, Father Theoclitos' classical work, Between Heaven and Earth, Athenite Monasticism, received the award of the Academy of Athens and eloquently brought the spirit and witness of the Holy Mountain to a new generation of readers. In his introduction to the chapters on love, he describes St. Maximus as one of the greatest mystical writers of the church and who decisively influenced Orthodox theology as well as our understanding of the life in Christ. He further notes that the chapters are not the result of mere intellectual speculation and that the confessor's ascetic and spiritual teaching does not constitute a form of psychological or psychoanalysis, as if it were based on nothing more than a series of clinical observations. Instead, the chapters are verbal representations of an internal revelation based on the saint's long years of monastic life and ascetic struggle, which through obedience, humility, and prayer, slowly brought about inner purification and illumination by the Holy Spirit. As a result, the confessor was granted spiritual wisdom and knowledge and became a teacher of both the practical and theoretical aspects of the spiritual life, especially with respect to the struggle against the passions and progress in the life of virtue. Father Theoclitos' translation and study of the chapters on love was an important milestone in the modern revival of interest in the thought of St. Maximus the Confessor, and demonstrates the ongoing relevance of the chapters to the ascetic and spiritual life. At precisely the same time that Father Theoclitos was working on his translation, Elder Emilianos was undertaking his own spiritual study of the chapters on love, and giving the six talks translated in this volume. Elder Emilianos' interest in St. Maximus the Confessor was part of his larger devotion to the writings of the Church Fathers, to the monks of Simonopetra and the nuns of Ormelia, he regularly gave ongoing series of talks in which he would provide detailed analysis and commentary on a particular patristic work. These include talks on the ascetical discourse of Abba Isaiah, the monastic rules of St. Anthony, St. Pacomius, and St. Augustine, the Ladder of Divine Ascent, the spiritual homilies of Macarius of Egypt, St. Hezekios of Sinai on watchfulness and holiness, St. Nilos, and that is I, Evagrius of Pontus on prayer, the life of St. Nilos the Calabrian, and the centuries of St. Thalassios the Libyan, who was a close friend of St. Maximus the Confessor, to mention only a few. Readers familiar with the writings of the elder available in English, i.e. the authentic seal, the church at prayer, the way of the spirit and psalms and the life of faith will already know the range and depth of his engagement with patristic and Byzantine ascetical literature. St. Maximus's chapters on love comprises 400 short sayings or propositions or aphorisms, which despite their relative brevity are traditionally known as chapters. The chapters are arranged in four groups of 100, each group referred to as a century, which is why the work is also known as the Centuries on Love. For his talks on the chapters on love, the elder selected 24 chapters taken exclusively from the second century, that is, chapters on love 2, 1 to 8, 12 to 17, 21, 24 to 28, 30, and 32 to 33. Remarkably, the limited number of chapters under consideration did not prevent the elder from conveying 
the full spirit of the confessor's teaching. To be sure, the depth of insight and the clarity of his explanations distinguish the elder as a brilliant commentator on the thought of St. Maximus. We might therefore regret that he did not comment at length on the chapters or on the other works by the confessor, but perhaps he did not need to. As St. Maximus once said, it was not necessary for him to say much because he knew he was addressing himself to a reader who was able to infer great things from a few things. It will be obvious to readers of even a few pages of this volume that the elder interprets the chapters on love and the Orthodox spiritual tradition more generally in such a way that its relevance is not limited to monks and nuns. Instead, the elder speaks directly to all Orthodox Christians and indeed to all human beings, regardless of their location in the church. As those familiar with the elder's works already know, his teaching is always fresh, practical, and intelligent. He is clear and effective communicator, using simple, straightforward examples to explain the complexities of the soul's inner life and its many struggles. Readers sense that he has firsthand experience and deep knowledge of the spiritual conditions and states that he describes. As one reader of the elder's writings once told me, quote, I connect effortlessly with his words and feel that whatever I am going through, whatever kind of place I've gotten myself into, the elder has somehow already been there and understands it better than I could have ever thought possible. And not only does he understand it, but he is also able to describe it clearly and show me how to overcome it. Nothing he says is about something or even someone else, but rather about me and indeed about each and every one of us." End quote. To read this book then is to place oneself in the presence of a true teacher and father in Christ. See 1 Corinthians 4, 15. A man filled with the grace of God who is able to communicate that grace through his words and teaching. In thinking about Elder Emilia Nos's remarkable gifts as a speaker and teacher, I am reminded of St. Maximus' description of his own teacher, a man he refers to only as the Blessed Elder, whom he describes in the prologue of the Mystagogy. Quote, This man was truly wise and a teacher in all forms of learning and he had rendered himself free from the bonds of matter and its mental images through his abundance of virtue and long familiarity with divine realities and love of ascetic labor, as a result of which he truly possessed a mind illumined by divine light and could see things that others do not see. In addition, he had the gift of words to explain most accurately the object of his contemplations, and like a mirror that is not obscured by any stain of the passions, he had the power of both understanding and speaking about things which others could not perceive, so that those who listened to him were able to see the whole meaning of his discourse, the whole content of his thoughts clearly perceived and all their meaning transferred to his listeners through the medium of his words." End quote. If we had to identify one of the central elements in Elder Emilianos' teaching, it would certainly be his extraordinary positive view of human potential. We find the same view in the writings of St. Maximus the Confessor, and indeed in Orthodox Christianity more generally. We were created for God, brought into being for God, who is both the origin and aim of our existence. To be created according to the image of God means to love and seek after one's divine source and archetype. See Genesis 1.27. To love God is something that comes naturally to us. It is something that is a part of our deep and inalienable nature. In order for us to realize and experience this love, we need only stop our mind from wandering, let go of our troubled thoughts, and silence our inner noise and turmoil at which the reality of God will come rushing towards us, a reality that has been rushing towards us from all eternity, though we are too distracted to see it. The more we empty our mind, the more it will be naturally filled with the presence and love of God, who pours himself out to us to the extent that we open our hearts to him. Rather than demand the arduous labors of asceticism, the elder emphasizes a simple yet profound change of mind and inner awareness. He knows that once we find the pearl of great price, which is our innate love for God, 
we will gladly sell all that we have. See Matthew 13, verses 45 to 46. On a practical level, most of us will not be willing or even able to assume the degree of bodily discipline and self-denial required, not by orthodox monasticism, but by the radical message of the gospel. In order for us to take up the daily cross of asceticism, Luke 9, 23, the elder knew that we must first experience the love of God, a revelation that shakes up our whole being, after which all things become possible. Now I can work. Now I can pray. Now I can renounce myself and offer my life in sacrifice because that is how I respond to the revelation of God's love. Love makes it possible to forget about ourselves. It takes us out of ourselves. It halts the relentless torrent of the self. It leads us out from our inner turmoil and confusion into stillness. It opens our hearts to divine love and compassion. And with songs of joy, it ushers us into the mystery of its spiritual banquet. Amin. Note on the text and translation. Elder Emilianos' commentary on St. Maximus the Confessor's chapters on love was originally delivered as a series of talks to the monks of the Holy Monastery of Simonopetra and later to the nuns of the Holy Convent of the Annunciation in Ormelia in 1975. The talks were transcribed and published in Greek. The Greek text of St. Maximus's Chapters of Love is available in Volume 2 of the Greek Philokalia. It may also be found in the following. It is a modern critical edition as well. There are four English translations of the chapter on love. See text for the notes on text and translation. End of introduction. Preamble. All of St. Maximus the Confessor's chapters on love are inspired by and reflect the everyday life of man and the mystical nuptial union of God and the soul. These chapters are, in other words, expressions of nuptial experiences. We can say that the legitimacy of our love for God is not unlike the legitimacy and fidelity characteristic of marriage. This means that the person who genuinely loves God does not divorce himself from God. He does not introduce a third person or party into the relationship that would compromise the fidelity of his soul's union to God. Chapter 1. He who genuinely loves God prays entirely without distraction, and he who prays entirely without distraction loves God genuinely. But he whose mind is fixed on any worldly thing does not pray without distraction, and consequently he does not love God. Because St. Maximus understands love to be a conjugal union with God, he cannot imagine that Love for God exists in a person who cannot pray without distractions. The absolutely necessary condition for the spiritual life is an undistracted mind because union with God takes place principally through the mind. When someone says, I am distracted by thoughts during prayer, or I can't concentrate during prayer, or I am cold and indifferent and don't feel anything during prayer, you can be sure that such a person does not love God genuinely and has never loved him. We often say that we love God and sing the praises of his love, but we are not able to pray without distractions. If this is the case, it means we are not speaking truthfully, that our praises are empty because genuine love for God is the generative cause of undistracted prayer. And Undistracted prayer is the generative cause of the love of God. Would you like to have a practical standard of measurement to see if you love God? Pay attention and observe whether or not you pray without distractions. See, in other words, if when you pray your mind is distracted and cut into pieces by desires, thoughts, passions, or by any other foreign element that is not spiritual or immaterial. If there is something that is able to divide our mind and cut it into pieces, this means that we do not love God, for the love of God is like a strong surrounding wall that protects us and prevents anything from outside entering our inner spiritual world. Otherwise, it's like I have a saw and I use it to cut up a piece of wood 
and in so doing, the pieces fly in different directions. Something similar happens to the mind when it is torn to pieces by thoughts and passions, by the various inclinations of the heart, by desires, and anything else like this. Does your mind pray without distraction? Does it remain untouched, unwounded, inviolate from every thought, activity, inclination, fantasy, and passion? If this is the case, then you can be sure that you love God. Undistracted prayer is a simple way of knowing whether or not you love God and is also a means for loving God. He who genuinely loves God prays entirely without distraction. There can be no doubt that you're fooling yourself if you think you love God when your mind is filled with distractions. What does it mean to genuinely love God? From what verb does the adverb genuinely come from? From the verb to be, which means to come into being and to be born. It means I am born naturally, that I am a son or daughter by nature, the son or daughter of my father and mother. I am not an illegitimate child. I am not born out of wedlock for someone who is not my mother or father. Thus the one who loves God genuinely is the one who naturally and truly loves God. And whatever such a person creates, whatever he gives birth to comes forth from a legitimate and lawful union. From this it follows that every thought, every desire, every impulse of self-will, every memory that divides and fragments me is an illegitimate offspring. It is neither from God nor from my spirit, which is conjoined and united to God. This means that the distraction of my mind is adultery. One could say that it's like having a strange woman on your mind who would rival God for your affections. It would be, in other words, an idol, and this is why scripture says that idolatry is adultery and calls our thoughts idols, that is, our reasons, opinions, ideas, motivations, and incentives. Moreover, when the Israelites fall into idolatry, falling victim to their thoughts and reasonings, scripture says that the sons of Israel committed fornication. Here's a simple example of what I mean. As I am praying, I feel within myself an impulse, the movement of a passion prompting me to act on it. This points to an act of adultery that has taken place in the depths of my being due to the passions of anger or desire, consistent with whatever it was that stirred up the impulse. On the other hand, the person who prays without distractions does not engage in adulterous couplings in his thoughts, but lives together faithfully with God. And whatever he creates, whatever he gives birth to, comes naturally and truly from God. From this it follows that the natural movement of the mind is a movement toward God. For this is the mind's natural activity and function, namely, to ascend to the Father. In this way, the words, he who genuinely loves God, refers to the things of the mind. That is, I love God genuinely when my mind genuinely ascends to God. Whoever genuinely loves God truly moves together with God, truly walks together with God, truly sees and is seen by God and is raised up together with him. But whoever is distracted in his mind during the time of prayer has already committed adultery in his heart and he is in love with whatever has entered his mind and separated him from God. And he who prays entirely without distraction loves God genuinely. Whoever prays without distractions has entered into a mystical marriage with God. Such a person can say the Alleluia of Revelation, the wedding hymn to God, which is the song of those who genuinely love God and who have genuinely been united to God. At the very beginning of the second century, St. Maximus makes a bold and decisive clarification. He doesn't want us to be deceived, to live an empty, deluded, and pointless life. He doesn't want us to waste our time living a life devoid of love. And so, from the very first sentence of the second century, he places love and prayer together under a single yoke, because it is prayer that unites us to God. But love, too, which is the opposite of self-isolation, egotism, and individualism, is also a union, a bond with another person or with many persons, and thus our bond with God is formed through prayer. Prayer is the transcendence of time and thus an entry into the timelessness, eternity, perfection, and splendor of God. 
Prayer is our inclusion in the life of God. And if I may put it in this way, our obliteration in God so that we might become one with him. This is what happens in prayer. This is what prayer is. And this is why love and prayer are so closely aligned that each can signify the other. But he whose mind is fixed on any worldly thing does not pray without distraction. When your mind during prayer at any time is not wholly fixed on God, but has become attached or diverted to something earthly or has turned aside or inclines towards something else, then you are not praying without distraction and you do not have love. When the mind is attached to something else, something other than God, then it is not possible to pray without distractions. To what does the mind incline? To things that belong to the mind and to which the mind has been enjoined. In other words, the mind inclines to things that conform to its way of thinking, to its wishes and to its desires. What I desire, what seems good to me, what I wish for, something I think I have to do, because if I don't, the world will fall apart, as people say, constitutes the turning of my mind away from God and prevents me from praying without distractions. Instead, the mind must be completely empty. All things must be removed from it. Everything must be submerged in the abyss of ignorance and oblivion so that the mind can reach upwards and be seized by God. The mind that dallies with a sensory object clearly has some passion for it, such as desire or sorrow or anger or resentment. Unless it despises the object, it cannot be freed from the passion. These words are a mirror in which we can see the depths of our soul. When the mind wanders away somewhere, this is hardly a chance or random occurrence. It is not simply the result of a stray thought or distraction, as if it were some fleeting thing that belonged to the passing present moment. To the contrary, it reveals that there is something deeply rooted within me, which I must find and uncover. For example, when I pray, I notice my mind has wandered off somewhere. When this happens, I can struggle to bring my mind back to the words I was saying to God. This, however, does not mean that I have achieved any kind of definitive victory. It is rather a momentary activity, a reaction to what took place in that particular moment. What is certain, however, and is of the essence here, is that if my mind wanders off somewhere to some thing, especially if it lingers there and constantly returns there, it means that I have a passion for that thing, and I must discover what this is. If I cannot discover it, my mind and my thoughts will return to it unceasingly. You come to me and ask, Elder, why do we th do this or that in our monastery when all the fathers of the church say we should do exactly the opposite? I explain the reason to you and you say, yes, I see, you are right. But a month goes by and the same question arises in your mind. Once again, you come to me. Once again, I explain the reason to you. And once again, you understand the reason. And you say, forgive me. It was my ego that drove me to ask that question. When a particular desire continually arises within us, by which I mean a particular chain of reasoning or line of thinking, when the same things continue to stir us up, or when we run into the same problems with people, or when something takes place that we do not like or approve of, what happens? We return yet again to the same thing that we have already discussed 15 or 20 times, or more like for 15 or 20 years. This means that we are in the grip of some kind of passion. Another example, you find yourself thinking or holding opinions that are contrary to those that prevail in the monastery, or that differ from what the abbot says. And you ask, what is God's will for me in this particular situation? The matter is clarified and you come to a resolution. After a while, however, you ask yourself again, what does God really want me to do in this situation? Insofar as what they're asking me to do doesn't make any sense. Should I simply be obedient and do it? Or has God sent me here to speak the truth? Once again, you, you've returned to your same old dilemma. The reoccurrence of this dilemma has nothing to do with the truth. It has nothing to do with love for the monastery, and it has nothing to do with humility. But it has everything to do with the particular passion that is at work within you. And this can be a way of thinking, 
a desire, a bit of egotism relative to whatever it is you are always returning to and mulling over in your thoughts. When you observe that your mind returns to some sensory physical thing or to some kind of thought or image, either because you are attracted to it or because you have some relation or attachment to it, or because it is some kind of source of power for you or fills you with a sense of vitality and so you become preoccupied with it, then you can be sure that some kind of passion is concealed within you. St. Maximus mentions a few such passions, desire or sorrow or anger or resentment. Let us consider each one of these in turn. Desire. When is desire a passion or when does it become a passion? Does this happen when it is an evil desire? No. Every desire by definition is a passion because when desire is active within us, we cannot pray without distractions. And this, as we said, means that instead of love for God, we have adultery, which we commit with the object of our desire. I desire means I turn my spirit, my perception, my feelings towards something. This something has power over me. It is like something that lives within me. It has a powerful hold over the way my thoughts incline. It stirs up the depths of my soul. It binds me closely to itself so that I become one with it. This deep bond, this deeply habituated inclination constitutes the reality par excellence of the fallen ego in the human person. Desire then is the means by which I bind myself intensely to something as if I had bound myself to it through marriage in such a way that now I cannot get by without it. And this desire can be of any good, any kind or evil. Sorrow. Sorrow refers to what we usually describe as being dispirited or embittered as when we say, you filled my heart with bitterness. To be dispirited means that my wishes were not fulfilled or that something failed to arouse strong feelings within me or it left me unsatisfied. I experience sorrow when something I think or believe fails to come about, when things do not meet my expectations, when I cannot satisfy my own desires, or because you have obliged me against my will to do something I did not want to do. To give you an example, it's like when you tell me, stop what you're doing and go over there and do that instead. Immediately, I am dispirited and I feel sad or disappointed because the change does not correspond to my wishes. It is at variance with what I think is best or right for me. I think, why are you taking me away from what I want to do? I enjoy the particular work that I do in the monastery, but not the work you want me to do. It doesn't interest me and I don't want to do it. Sorrow then is something that stems from restrictions or constraints that are placed on my ego. But in reality, it has nothing to do with what others may say or do to me, but rather with what I have inside myself, what I think or feel, what I believe and what I want, especially when you don't do what I want or you deny what I want or take it away from me. Seen from this point of view, sorrow is the experience of being closed off within myself. It is the complete egotistical stubborn state of self incarceration within the confines of my individual being, a complete isolation of myself from the other. Sorrow is one of the mortal sins because isolation within the ego means isolation from God and neighbor. Yet my neighbor is a member of the body of Christ. His presence to me is the presence of God. Sorrow, on the other hand, is separation from God. And when such sorrow becomes chronic, it becomes a definitive separation from God. If I am continuously sorrowful in this way, I am living my life as if God does not exist. Do you see then how desire and sorrow are related? Desire on the one hand means that my spirit has become attached to something, my emotional energy, we might say, or the inclination of my will, my soul has gotten stuck somewhere. Sorrow on the other hand is caused by the denial or loss of what I feel or what I believe or what I want. Anger. Pay particular attention so that you can understand what is meant by anger and how everything begins from the ego and how our passions separate us from God and from our fellow human beings. Anger means wrath or irascibility and refers to the spirit of aggression, which of course brings us back to what we said about sorrow. 
Anger means outrage, indignation, as well as an impulse for revenge and self-vindication. The noun anger comes from the verb to have an appetite for, which means I extend or incline myself to or toward something. For example, I open my hand and stretch forth my arm, by means of which I extend my whole self, I incline towards something, and place myself, as it were, here or there. The idea of extending oneself in this way has the primary sense of being against someone or towards something, in order to make it mine, to define my relationship to it in a particular way. Against someone means that I also make him my own in a certain way, since I isolate myself from my neighbor and I make him my enemy. Towards something or someone means I throw myself forcefully at the other whom I seek to overwhelm and eliminate. It means I mark someone as the object of my anger and hostility and await the moment when I can strike at him. Anger, then, is the desire to wound the other, to mark the other for injury. When we say, he's angry at someone, we mean that he has marked him, made him a target, and is waiting for the moment when he can strike him with his arrow. It is as if he would like to throw all his weight against his perceived enemy in order to release all his impassioned anger and rage. In essence, to be angry at someone means that we are ill-disposed towards that person, that we have a will to dislike and be hostile toward that person. To have such a disposition, to bear this kind of hostility toward someone, reveals the presence of a passion within us, and indeed a desire or longing to destroy someone, or a desire to conquer and triumph over someone, making him my own. Altogether, we can say that desire is an internal turn or inclination towards something that I think or believe. Sorrow is the internal resistance or opposition to something that others impose on me and which contradicts my ego. Anger, finally, is the external manifestation of my sorrow, my resistance, directed toward the person whom I identify as its cause. Resentment. The notion of resentment has a deeper, more inward meaning. It is not simply my assault, as it were, on the other, but it means I take the negative thing, which I believe you have done to me, and internalize it within myself. I keep it under lock and key, and I await an opportunity to unleash my anger and attack you. I hold on to the negative thing, and at the right time, which is always the wrong time, I strike. The resentful person is the one who has permanently established within himself his opposition toward someone else, who has made permanent his commitment to act on his feelings of hostility, to act on what he thinks or believes, to realize whatever it is that he thinks will give him a feeling of completeness and satisfaction. Resentment is the definitive turning away from the other. This is why the resentful person is not able to experience love, happiness, or compassion. Such a person thinks no one loves him, that everyone is out to get him, conspires against him, talks about him behind his back. He made that remark about me. He was actually talking about me when he said that. He must know something that he's not saying, and so on. The resentful person spends his life in prison behind a thousand walls. No matter how many of these walls he might demolish, he will never be able to communicate with his brothers unless the merciful God comes to his aid and knocks down all the walls. Up until this point, the meaning of the confessor's teaching is, when your mind dallies with a sensible object, when your mind repeatedly returns to a particular place, especially during the time of prayer, it means that you are in the grip of a passion, that is, a deep-seated impulse or powerful inclination. St. Maximus mentioned these passions that people most commonly suffer from, desire, sorrow, anger, and resentment. Unless the mind despises the object, it cannot be freed from the passion. If a person does not despise the thing toward which he is inclined, which he desires, he will remain the eternal slave of his passion, bound by a thousand chains. What is the meaning of de despise here? It means to turn my mind away from something. It means I no longer think about it in the way that I used to. It means I have changed my mind about it. If I had formerly stood in a fixed relationship to something, I now alter my way of thinking and see it differently. Now I despise and look down on it. For example, what the worldly man thinks is good and correct, 
I see as crooked. And what he sees as crooked or twisted, I see as prudent and right. I live in a way that is disdainful of things in my past, a way that expresses the different manner in which I now understand and approach life. To despise something then means that I depart from what had been my usual way of thinking about things. It also means that I have, have to learn how to think anew, to become a fool for the sake of Christ. Indeed, whoever seeks to discern the deeper motivation behind the movements of his will, to understand the places in which his mind has gotten stuck and the reason why it got stuck, does exactly the opposite of what worldly people do. And so in the eyes of the world, he has become foolish. It has to be understood, of course, that when St. Maximus says we must despise every object toward which our mind inclines, he is not advocating some kind of anxious or anxiety-ridden life, as if we had to live in a state of constant suspicion and fear that there are passions hiding behind everything. Instead, he teaches us a way of freedom and of the free activity of the soul, which, because its attention is turned to itself, is able easily to discern its passions. It is enough to reject a worldly way of thinking and to think with a new mind. Does your mind keep returning to something? With respect to this something, you need to change your mind. If you don't change your mind, if you don't learn to see things differently, if you don't stop throwing yourself at the object of your desire, you will never be free from your passion. Whatever it is you think or believe, whatever it is you think you love, or that your mind has become attached to, you must strike it with a divine passion, with hate, and then your passion will be set aside by divine power, by divine grace, and you will lay the foundations that will enable you eventually to love God. Here's a simple example. Someone says something to you, and afterwards you wonder, why did he say that? It must be because of his ego, or because he's a hypocrite. Do you see? Immediately we respond, with one contradiction after another. For me to say that the per other person is egotistical or a hypocrite or has bad thoughts means that I believe I think differently than he does. It means that I disagree with him and the things he does. But I must despise this kind of attitude. I must change my mind about it and seek to identify my thought with the thought of the other. I must learn how to live with him, how to feel and think like he does. If I don't do this, I will never be free from the passion that troubles me. And what is the passion that troubles you? It is easy for a person to discover what kind of passion he suffers from, whether it is desire, sorrow, anger, resentment, or some other passion. I see someone, for example, and right away a negative thought enters my mind. This means that I see something or understand something differently than he does. I go and talk to him. We discuss the matter. And I see that he is correct. But later on in a similar situation, the same negative thought enters my mind, which means that I have accomplished nothing. And a thousand excuses and explanations, a thousand confessions to the person in question or to my spiritual father or to the icon of Christ, a thousand tears, an endless number of prostrations will accomplish nothing. If that is, I don't change my mind. If I don't change the way I think about others and learn to live with them, I must enter into a fullness of relation with others. My disposition towards them must be one of love. Otherwise, my thoughts will always fly away and get the better of me. And I will remain a person filled with passions, even if I am correct in thinking that there is something wrong with the other person. Only when I can love the other person can I be free of my false and corrupt love. Only then can I be free of my old way of thinking and free from the passions that holds me in its grip. I need, in other words, to disdain and despise whatever I was holding on to and to think in a manner consistent with the way the other thinks. And what if, you will surely ask, the other person does not think correctly? In that case, I can have my own opinion, but in my dealings with this other person, I will conduct myself in a manner consistent with the way he thinks. In my relationship with him, I will incline toward his opinion about things, even though this may create some inner tension for me. When I am by myself and dealing with some other matter that concerns only myself, I will do what I believe is right. But when we are with someone else, we will do what he wants, 
We will do what he believes should be done, unless, of course, what he wants to do is sinful. Between what I want and what he wants, there is no middle ground, no compromise solution. Every attempt at compromise, every argument, explanation, and attempt to persuade the other is simply the self, the ego, taking its stand like an irrational animal that digs its hind feet into the ground and ref refuses to budge. And this is nothing less than my eternal separation from the other and from God. The way I order and regulate my personal inner journey is one thing, and the way I order my relations with my fellow human beings is another. I am able to make these kinds of distinctions, but I must make them properly, lawfully, with love and absolute respect for the other as the image of God, in a manner that enables me to venerate him and to believe that he is a saint and I am a sinner. Only then do I have the right to continue my journey independently of him without, however, losing the internal bond that unites me to him. If something should happen to separate us, this is not from God. It is better to stay with a person who is, it is better to stay with a person who is wrong and go together with him into hell than to go into paradise alone. Because if you arrive there by yourself, you'll find that the door will be closed. Going with the other means that I deny myself. It means that you are moving in a manner not unlike God, in a manner appropriate and fitting to God. And what is fitting to God? The denial of myself, the emptying of myself in order to be filled by God. In order for this to happen, we must first uncover our passions. But the passions as a rule are things that are hidden. We are not aware of their influence. This is why St. Maximus tells us that in order to enter into ourselves, we must hold the reins of the self tightly and look deeply into ourselves and observe what is taking place so that we might be able to understand and articulate whatever is at work inside us. For instance, the monastery decides to let a field lie follow, but in your mind you immediately object. But, you'll say, this isn't right, it will cost us, we will have less to eat, and so on. In your mind, you think you're defending what is right and just. You believe that you are only concerned about the interests of the monastery. You think your heart is filled with love and that you are right. But listen to what St. Maximus is telling you. When your mind keeps returning to something, in this case, the field in question, it means that what you have inside yourself is not justice, truth, or love, but passion. When I come to understand that a cause is producing a certain effect and that my mind's attachment to something is the effect, that it is the result of a cause and that this cause is a passion, then in that very same moment, I uncover the passion. Otherwise, it would be like hearing a noise and saying that it was caused by the cicadas or the birds to which someone says, no, it was nothing. But the sound had to come from somewhere it had to have a source. No, no, it was nothing. The sound you heard came from nothing. This is what we do when we insist that we have no passions within us, as if the things taking place in our soul had no cause. The problem is not that it is difficult to find the passions that are in us, but that we don't want to find them. We don't want to know they are there, or we are under the sway of such things, since this would make us feel as if the ground had fallen from away from under our feet. This is because we have become dependent on a false image of ourself that we have and we hold on to tightly in order not to lose it. And when you hold on to it like that, there's no room left inside you for anything else. Then we are left wondering, where is God? The answer is simple. By holding on so tightly to our sense of self, we choked God, strangled him, and put him to death. But, you might ask, can God die? He can die to us. He can be dead to each and every one of us. But can he rise again? Yes, when you change your mind, when you repent, when you do this, God comes to life within you. He rises up within you, and then you celebrate the resurrection of Christ. You are baptized again, born again, and you give him the right to take away your passions and lead you to a place of freedom. Of course, even though it is true that one can easily discover what his passions are, this does not mean that we are able to fight against them. This is not what St. Maximus says. 
Instead, he teaches that freedom from the passions is something granted to you by God's grace, which comes about when you abandon yourself to the Holy Spirit. God will enlighten you to understand that there is a snake concealed in the grass, but only he can remove it. What then are you supposed to do? Change your mind. Change the way you think. In a word, repent. I've seen how the inclination of my will deceives me. I've seen how my desires and attachments distort my view of the world. Now, however, I follow the will of another and am doing exactly the opposite of what I used to do. This act of self-denial, which is the denial of my will, and in particular of the inclination of my will, is a basic presupposition for God to look upon us in mercy and at some point to grant us the gift of freedom from the passions. And when we come to hate our lives in this world and to bind ourselves to those around us in love, then God will grant us this gift. As a rule, though, we love ourselves. We prop up the idea of ourself at all costs and refuse to see and accept the truth about it. But by seeking to maintain our notion of ourselves, we deny that we are in the grip of the passions. But if we do the opposite, we can make progress. As we said, it is not difficult to know what your passion is. Pay attention to where your mind goes. Either it will go to your passion or to Christ or to something else. It is not possible for the human mind to be nowhere. It has to grab onto something, latch onto something. And this something is what gives it a feeling of fullness and satisfaction. And this will either be God or something other than God. St. Maximus is not engaging in psychoanalysis, but is offering a deep spiritual diagnosis of the state of our being, a laying bare of the depths of the soul. He strips us naked so that we might see all that is ugly and ill-formed within us. If we want to, we can correct ourselves. We can change our minds. If on the other hand, we don't want to do this, if we don't want to disdain and despise the things that keep us down and hold us back, we will remain in the grip of the passions for all eternity, which means we will be adulterers for all eternity, or rather adulterated for all eternity. We will be separated eternally from God, having embraced an idol in the place of the Lord. When St. Maximus the Confessor speaks about love, he gives us the opportunity to understand how easy it is to, to love God. All we need to do is pay attention to where our mind goes. If it doesn't go to God, we need to realize that our mind does not see clearly and has need of a physician who can perform the right kind of surgery in order to correct our vision. When a person is born, it is natural for him to see people singly and whole and not double, to see things clearly and correctly, not as slanted or twisted, which is not natural. It is natural to see things clearly and correctly. What is natural, simple, and easy, and makes us healthy and happy is the love of God, which is as natural as the eyes seeing and the mouth speaking. The mouth is not able to walk, but has been made to speak. The hand is for holding, embracing, giving alms, and to make the sign of the cross. These are their natural functions, and they are all very easy. If you try to walk on your hands, it will be difficult and uncomfortable, since this is not what they were made for. In the same way, it is natural for the mind to be turned to and focused on the love of God, because it is toward God that the human mind naturally tends. Just as our eyes naturally open to the light, so too does our mind open naturally to God, who is the creator of light. The absence of love is a sickness, while the presence of love is health. Whenever someone wants to, he can love God genuinely and become the spouse of God. What more could a person desire? And how much more so a person living in a monastery? For what is a monastery, if not a ceaseless nuptial union with God, day and night? This is why we need to make sure that first, our prayer is stable and focused. Second, when our prayer is stable and focused, we must not deceive ourselves, but rather recognize that we do not love God and seek for the straight path that leads to Him. Make straight the paths of the Lord, says St. John the Baptist, and so let us make our minds straight paths conducting us to God. Third, when we see that our mind has wandered off to some habitual thought, memory, image, or experience, we should know that we are 
distancing ourselves from God. The place to which our minds go, no matter what it is, and no matter whether it is bound to our power of desire or anger or from our will, is God's rival for our affections, and it causes us to throw off the yoke that unites us to God. It doesn't matter if you think it is something filled with light, holiness, righteousness, and wonder. It doesn't matter if your mind is swept away in ecstasy before the majesty of what you think you found and which so easily draws your mind away. In truth, it would be better to be poor and wretched by not having such a thing than by having it to wander away from God. Just as it is natural to walk, only someone with an illness or disability has difficulty walking, so too is it natural to walk truly and rightly toward God, to draw near to Him. Let us understand the ease and agreeable nature of such walking. Even though we were separated from God, covering ourselves with fig leaves, not realizing that these would become a wall separating us from God, He did not cease to love us and broke down those walls and gave us the possibility to draw near to Him, to embrace Him and be united to Him. Let us rejoice in this freedom that He has given us and for the greatness of which He has deemed us worthy, that is, of His love. For me, as a monk, to walk means that I love God. When I say, I love God, it means I have no trouble walking. It means I am not slow, nor do I drag my feet. It was for this love that we put on these robes which make us look similar, even though previously we were all very different. We were isolated individuals and now we are a communion of persons. We talk about love, but we really don't understand what we're saying. Let us therefore offer thanks to God and his saints, especially to St. Maximus the Confessor, who has revealed the truth to us and made our hearts draw closer to God. If only for a moment you long for the things of which St. Maximus is speaking, then you will see how much you will change and how your whole being will be illumined. Just for one moment, truly long for these things, and immediately you will see how easy it is. Is it possible that God would ask difficult things of us? It is possible he would place burdens on us, and it would be a tremendous burden indeed if God made us do things that were difficult. Such a God would be grim, implacable, unforgiving, like some sort of tyrant oppressing our soul. But all of these things are impossible. Such a thing could never be true. For St. Maximus to say that love is the fullness and completion of everything, that love is perfection, and that love unites us with God can only mean that love is not difficult but easy. And I say this too. If love is also undistracted prayer, then undistracted prayer is the easiest and most natural activity for the human mind. It is the natural inclination, activity, and movement of the mind to God. For me to say that I love God and I pray without distractions means that I am truly alive, that I live truly. When I don't love God and when I don't pray in this manner, I am not truly living. I have seen how much grace God gives you through prayer and how much you thirst for prayer. Continue to thirst for it and you will see even greater wonders. All the things written in the books we read, all the promises that God has made to us will become a reality for us. I know that you are close to the love of God and that you have this love when you pray correctly. I only ask that you fill my heart with joy and make my soul rejoice by being genuine children and genuine spouses of God. Chapter 2 when the passions dominate the mind, they bind it to material things, and having separated it from God, make it to be entirely engrossed in them. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love 2, verse 3. In this chapter, St. Maximus continues to develop his thought, stating that it is necessary for you to uncover your passions, otherwise they will bind your mind to material things. Let's say for the sake of an example that you failed your university entrance examinations and from time to time the thought of this comes back to you and troubles you. If this happens, you should realize that you have within yourself a passion. And if you don't identify this passion, the memory of your failure will never leave you. And after 50 years, when something else happens to you, 
if people upset you or hurt your feelings, you will remember that at some point earlier in your life, you were a failure. You'll say to yourself, if I had not failed then, I would not be so upset now. From situations like this, entrenched and in repetitive cycles of thought are created within you that distance you from God. For you to be free from all of this, the passion in question needs to be wiped away because it is like an insurmountable obstacle that does not allow the mind to be free, but keeps it within a state of bondage. It is important to know that the passions do not bind the mind directly to themselves because the mind is innately related to God, whereas the passions are an evil within the soul, a blameworthy movement or impulse. And if you were to see and clearly understand the nature of the passions, your mind would naturally struggle and fight against them. What then do the passions do? They do the same thing that the devil does. When the devil seeks to tempt you, he does not present himself to you as evil, openly telling you, for example, to go and steal, because you would immediately resist and reject such a suggestion, saying, let us stand well. Instead, he tells you things like, you should be fasting more. Don't you see how much progress your brother has made by fasting more than you do? In other words, the devil hides behind what he presents to your mind as a good idea, and so you mistake him for God or for something good and holy, but all the while the serpent is doing his work undetected. If, on the other hand, you knew it was Satan, you would immediately say, Get behind me, Satan. This is why the passions do not bind the mind directly to themselves, because if this were the case, they would immediately be exposed. How then do the passions operate? In the case of those whose hearts have been hardened, whose minds have grown dark, and whose consciences have been blunted, the passions bind the mind to material things that we think are harmless, since we tell ourselves God gave them to us, and in themselves they are not sinful. Let's say, for example, that you like food and you think, in the monastery we fast all the time. All I ask is that the food on Sunday be tasty. But for you to be thinking about this means that your mind is on food, on the idea of food, and the idea of eating is always on your mind. You're not asking for something evil, but for something that seems perfectly reasonable. Yet there is a greater danger hidden here because the very propriety, the legality, we might say, of what you're focused on binds you to what is really going on below the surface and leads you to freely enslave yourself to it. And having separated the mind from God, they make it to be entirely engrossed in them, in material things. In this way, everyone's mind runs in different directions, to his work on the monastery grounds, to the desires of his self-will, to the things he longs for, to wondering why there is no justice in the monastery, or why the monastery is focused on mundane and not spiritual things, or why the monks don't seem to care about each other, saying, there is no love among us, no sense of sacrifice. You saw how no one made an effort to help poor father so-and-so when he was in trouble. Of course, the person complaining thinks he is going to bring love into the monastery when he has no idea how closely bound he is to material considerations and not to God. Do you see how devious the passions are and how deceptively they work against us? But when the love of God prevails, it frees the mind from its bonds, persuading it to despise not simply sensory things, but even this transient life of ours. With these words, St. Maximus continues to develop the notion of despising the things of the world, which we saw in the previous chapter, although now he reveals its deeper meaning. The love of God persuades us to think differently than the way worldly people think. Worldly people think that material things in this transient life are of far greater interest and importance than they really are. I don't think they are of any interest. Worldly people think you can't live without such things. I will live without them. Slowly, but surely, you will come to understand that the problem is not the material things in and of themselves. Material things are not bad or evil in themselves. What is bad is the way we think about them, how we approach them, and how we use them. A person's whole life can be bad, so that whatever is sacred, good, and beautiful appears negative or repulsive to him. This is why I disdain and despise this temporary life. I do not want to live such a life. Instead, I want only God. 
And to the extent that the things of this world make it difficult for me to hold God continually within my mind, it is better to die, just as St. Paul says, it is better to die and be with Christ. Philippians 1.23 Quite naturally, then, a person is led to a state of mind that is purely eschatological, to a mind that looks beyond this life and thinks only of the next. When someone possesses divine love, he or she no longer wishes to live in this present state of existence, but is concerned only about the future. This is because they realize that whenever the mind is drawn away and becomes preoccupied with something, with its problems, its life, or with some material thing, good or bad, it does not love God and runs the risk of forgetting Him altogether. This is why when you come to me with a problem, and I do not make the time to discuss it with you, it seems to you that I do not care about you. It is likely, however, that you'll get over this worldly way of thinking, probably because of your love for me and the trust you place in me. But I'm not sure that this can be considered spiritual maturity. Real maturity is when you understand that the problem you're struggling with is the sign of a worldly spirit, an indication that you do not love God. If I have a problem, it means that my mind is preoccupied with something and that behind the problem is a passion which I am concealing, nurturing, and gestating within myself. At some point, it will give birth to a serpent that will poison me. This is why we say that a person who is preoccupied with things, who is always busy, running around, filled with troubles and anxieties, is a person without God because his mind is not on God but on everything else. This is exactly what we saw in the first chapter when we spoke about not genuinely loving God. It's as if a strange woman to whom you are not married has entered your life. St. Maximus seeks to lift up the human spirit and give it wings so that it might soar to the heavens. This is why he uncovers for us the true meaning of life, namely that life is spiritual. It is born upward by the Holy Spirit. The wings of the Holy Spirit lift up the wings of the human spirit, freeing it from every weight and heaviness and enabling it to rise upward. Conversely, preoccupation with material things, worldly interests, and the cares of life are like weights that oppress and drag us down. Often we go to our spiritual father, hoping that he can take care of our problems. We might as well say to him, please don't talk to me about God, just help me to deal with life's difficulties. Help me to organize my affairs better so that things are easier for me. Help me to get what I want or what I think or what I love despite the difficulty that I am facing. Too often we go to our spiritual father, even when we go to confess our sins, not because we care about God, but because we care only about the things of this world, because we're looking for solutions to the problems of this life. Do you see how worldly such a way of thinking is and how closely bound it is to this world and to this life? But in order to love God, you must be free and no one binds himself to worldly things is free because his spirit remains closely tied to the earth, unable to fly to the heavens. St. Maximus began with the love of God and from there he took us to the question of prayer. From prayer, he took us to the mind and from the mind, he took us to sensory material objects, and from sensory and material objects, which include events, situations, and problems, we uncovered the passions which bind the soul to this life and in general to the material world. With this next chapter, we shall come closer to the problem that interests us. The purpose of the commandments is to render simple our mental images of things. The purpose of reading, contemplation, is to render the mind immaterial and free of mental impressions. From such a mind comes undistracted prayer. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love 2, 4. To continue the text, Very well, St. Maximus, I am filled with passions, just as you say. I myself do not clearly see this, but to the extent that my mind is drawn to material things, I understand that this means that I have passions, that I am impassioned, what am I to do about this? How am I to be free of this situation? How am I to extract myself from it, to break the heavy bonds that material things have over me? In this fourth chapter, St. Maximus gives us the answer. Here he shifts his focus and speaks about things on a more practical level. He shows us the way we must travel in our daily lives, a way that will lead us to union with God. He presents us with the image of the person who struggles ascetically, first and foremost with the keeping of the commandments, 
and second with reading and contemplation. With the words, the purpose of the commandments, we understand in a very basic way our assimilation of God's will. The commandments are manifestations of God. They are things that have been uttered by God, and thus they are an extension of God himself. They come directly from him, and to them my will must be united. Thus, the purpose of the commandments is at the very outset my being filled with the law of God, my comprehension of God's economy of salvation, of his plan, which the commandments express, reveal, and interpret. By keeping the commandments, there is a sense in which I enter into the plan and work of God himself. I walk together with him. My assimilation of God's will has a practical outcome, which we can could call a moral or ethical outcome. In my daily life, I live as God does. I work just as he does. The Son communi- communes unceasingly with the Father, and I commune unceasingly with the Father and the Son. My Father is still working, and I am still working. Ethically applying, we might say, the commandments of God, applying whatever God does and expresses. In a very concrete way, I realize God's commandments. I work to refine their expression in my life. I administer the statutes of God. The point of departure for my life is what is just in the eyes of God, which means to give to God those things that belong to him. This is what we mean when we say we have to assimilate our will to God, to make God's will our own, because within ourselves we cannot have any other will. You often hear people say that in every moment, in every event, we must seek to discover the will of God. But such an approach is rather narrow and scholastic, and in the end, it only leads you to anxieties and doubts. All it does is show that the person is troubled, worried, caught up in problems, and thus at a distance from God. Our will needs to be absorbed by the will of God. When this happens, there is no agonized questioning about what God wants, because in a certain way, I am not, as it were, conditioned or colored by my own will, but I enact the will of God. And God's will is something very simple and within reach. There's no need for someone to puzzle over what it is or how to recognize it or how it should be acted on in every single instance. When a person reaches this point, which is the basic point of departure for the spiritual life, then it is easy to enter into the mind of the Lord. The purpose of the commandments then is rendering to God what belongs to God. It is, we could say, my self-identification with God, my being found together with God, with what he thinks and with what the Holy Trinity thinks together as one. The moral or ethical life, which is the concrete application of God's commandments, does not consist in, I must do this and not do that. This is forbidden, that is permitted. To the contrary, morality is essentially a fullness of life in God, having as its basic element the assimilation of God's will and the rendering to God of all that belongs to him so that my work and activity are in accord with God who is still working. The purpose of the commandments is to render simple our mental images of things. Why does St. Maximus say this? In the previous chapters, he said that when someone prays, he must not have a thought or image in his mind, since this will immediately displace the presence of God. A thought or image, in so far it is something that belongs to us, has tremendous force behind it. It is something that fills us in such a way that God is not able to enter. I therefore have to empty my mind of every thought. However, in my everyday life, I see that my mind is filled with thoughts. What am I to do? In the first place, I must keep God's laws and commandments. If I do not begin with this, I will make no progress. But this by itself does not have the power to remove thoughts from my mind, which is the work and activity of divine love. Although keeping the commandments does succeed in rendering simple our mental images of things. To render simple means to reduce something to its essentials, to strip it bare of something that might normally or naturally be associated with it, like removing trees from a forest or taking away weapons from a soldier. In this context, to render simple means to take away from things those aspects that are the source of problems for me. It means I remove from them their circumstantial power so that they no longer trouble or disturb me. It's like removing the teeth from an animal so that it can no longer bite you. 
Thus, to render simple our mental images of things means that things in the world no longer create in the mind any particular mental images or fantasies. My power of imagination, which is my capacity to fantasize, is no longer troubled or aroused by material things because now they remain neutral, as if I were no longer seeing them in garish colors, but in black and white. To be sure, because I am not perfect, my mind still possesses content based on the perception of these things, but I no longer feel any attraction towards them triggered by memories or mental images associated with them. Now I live in a world of things that no longer pose a danger to me because I no longer have within myself anything that desires the feeling of attraction to them. I am free of that power which attracted me to things that previously appeared desirable or attractive. Again, this is not a state of purification because if my mind were totally purified, there would be no mental image whatsoever. But now the image that I do have in my mind no longer exerts control over me. It has been rendered simple, stripped bare of its sinful associations and power of attraction. In this way, I have attained a certain degree of freedom from the passions, although this freedom is not yet definitive. Let's consider an example of what I mean. I see a woman, and this creates within me an image of a woman. This image can become for me the cause of temptation if, that is, it acquires an internal intensity or strength, in which case it becomes an impassioned image. However, it is also possible that the image exerts no force or power within me, in which case it is simple or mere image of a woman. This means that a simple image is, as we say, bare, because it is not clothed with the energy of the passions. It does not arise within me from an impassioned depth. This is how I am able to have thoughts about things that do not trouble me, that do not create within me sequences of associations, good or bad. They do not injure my soul in any way. They simply pass through my mind and are gone. But most of us typically have thoughts that remain in our minds and create all kinds of conditions, moods, and feelings. By keeping the commandments, however, and by the grace of God, I am able to have only the simple images of things, even while living in the midst of things. At this point, I do not escape thoughts altogether, but neither do I become passionately attached to them. From this, you can see the value in the first practical stage of the ascetical life, which raises me up from the hell of my slavery to things in the world around me. St. Maximus describes a second way, which also leads me to the true love of God, namely the contemplative, contemplative life, which consists of reading and contemplation. This life does not deny or reject the keeping of commandments on which it relies for its foundation. The keeping of the commandments is the first step, and one must have his foot on this step before he can progress to the level of contemplation, even though advancing from ascetic practice to contemplation is not a given, as if it were some kind of mechanical process. Ascetic practice is needed, although it is not impossible for some people to proceed directly to contemplation. The interconnection of ascetic practice and contemplation is another question. If someone wants to be a general, he's not going to get promoted to that position from the rank of corporal unless there is a war and he demonstrates extraordinary heroism, putting his life at risk and shedding his blood and has made a general honoris causa, which such things are rare. The same is true if you want to become a saint. You're not going to get there directly from the rank of corporal, that is, from the state of rudimentary ascetical practice, since you're not capable of serving as a general. So you have to follow the straight path that leads to God, the path of reading and contemplation. And reading is a helpful element or aspect of contemplation. The purpose of reading and contemplation is to render the mind immaterial and free of mental impressions. By reading is meant spiritual reading, that is attention to spiritual concepts and ideas. Here, the word reading is not connected to the idea of study, which belongs to the first stage, but instead is connected to contemplation. See Elder Emiliano's spiritual study in The Church at Prayer, the Mystical Liturgy of the Heart, to continue. It has the same meaning as the verse in the Psalms, which says, you will study the law of the Lord day and night, Psalm 1-2. Here the verb study does not mean simply to read or examine or analyze, but to cultivate the spiritual sense of the text. If reading is the cultivation of spiritual meanings with 
in the text, contemplation is the inward orientation of our spirit toward God, as well as God's response and revelation within us. It is the spiritual vision and apprehension of things. It is the very grace of God leading and guiding our spirit through the spiritual world. Spiritual reading is the human effort to know and recognize God, an activity or process that makes God known to me, that speaks to me concerning God and brings me closer to Him. But contemplation, which comes after this, is something that God Himself leads us to in response to our spiritual reading and study. Contemplation presupposes divine activity, that is, the uncreated energy of God, which penetrates my mind and gives me contemplative purity and clarity, enabling me to see God. Contemplation is thus the inner and experiential knowledge and recognition of God. I can assert, for example, that God is a trinity, and I can try to demonstrate this using one kind of philosophy or another. I can be an excellent dogmatic theologian, and yet have absolutely no inner spiritual understanding or awareness of what I'm talking about. Another person, however, can speak to you about God as Trinity based on what he has seen and heard, because he experiences God inwardly. He has been illumined and informed directly by God, and not from books and articles. This inward assurance from God, this revelation of God himself to the human person, is contemplation. As a rule, when we speak of the contemplative life, we do not absolutely identify it with contemplation, but give it broader significance since we understand it to refer to a way of life that leads to contemplation. When I come to know God through spiritual reading, I come to know first and foremost the things around or about God. But when God himself appears and encounters me and makes my spirit touch the marks of the nails, by which I mean the signs of the divine economy of salvation, illumined by the brilliant light of the Trinity, then I enter into personal relation with him. And it is then that my mind becomes immaterial and free of mental impressions, unburdened of all its weight. What are the things that weigh on the mind? Let's suppose I have a problem or something is troubling me. I visit a monastery, but no one greets me with any warmth or affection. No one says, welcome, Father, we are so happy to have you here with us. I imagine I have come on a bad day, or that they're busy with other things, or that maybe they're tired, or because of this they offer me only the most standard kind of reception. Then my mind starts thinking, what am I doing here? Who knows what these people think of me? Perhaps they don't even want me to be here. Maybe they see me as some kind of burden. But who am I, anyway? I'm not anybody they should notice or care about. I'm not worthy of their time or attention. So what am I doing here? I'll just leave. The mind grows very weary carrying these kinds of weights. You've noticed, I'm sure, what you're like when you're burdened with a problem or when something is weighing on your mind. You become downcast, heavy, and sluggish. Your head aches. Your heart can experience palpitations. Your stomach gets upset. It's like you've been stuck in mind, struck in mind and heart. Conversely, the way of spiritual reading and contemplation makes the mind immaterial, as St. Maximus says, removing every burden and weight that has become attached to it, making it pure and receptive of God, and free of mental impressions. This path does not simply remove from the mind whatever has become attached to it, but whatever has entered into it. It makes it formless, removes the forms and shapes and images that have been impressed and imprinted deeply within it, so that the mind becomes simple, bare, empty of every thought and image, so that it can now contain God. As we said a moment ago, keeping the commandments does not remove the mental images, but it does make them simple, free of sinful inclinations, free of temptations, free of passions. To be sure, both of these two ways are proper to the monastic life, but the first way, the keeping of the commandments, is especially appropriate to those living in the world. Keeping the commandments, one could say, pulls a person out of the mud, but it does not remove the stains and dirt that remain. But such people can nonetheless live in the world in the midst of money, possessions, a wife, children, and so on, without any of these things being occasions for sin. The monk lives a different life. He does not have a wife. He does not have money. He does not hold personal possessions, and so is in a position to progress through spiritual reading to contemplation. Being free of worldly cares and burdens, the monk is free to fly to heaven. 
but he must want to do this. Otherwise, even if he has wings, he will remain on the ground. At most, he might jump up a little bit into the air, but gravity will soon pull him back to earth. From such a mind comes undistracted prayer. Because spiritual reading and contemplation make the mind immaterial and free of mental images, which is to say that they empty the mind, they grant it the gift of undistracted prayer, and through this the love of God. Contemplation is not a matter of fantasies and dreams, but an inward illumination, a downpour of grace that falls upon the mind and overwhelms it. If then you want to pray without distractions, you have to follow this path. Don't focus on things or on what you're doing or what you've achieved or think you're achieved or on what lies ahead or what happened and what didn't happen. Instead, proceed immediately to the point of departure to the knowledge of God, namely spiritual reading and contemplation. These alone will guide you to undistracted prayer, which will come to you by itself. It will be given to you by the grace of God. When this happens, I will understand inwardly and experientially that grace is a gift from God, because what I could never have achieved on my own, even with thousands of struggles, I suddenly find present and operative within me. Who placed this gracious gift within me? I did not have it. It was not something that I achieved nor was it possible for me to achieve it. How did this happen? This is the mind's revelation when confronted with the event of divine grace, of God's gift and charisma. In other words, suddenly I realize that I have become a bearer of God's grace, but in such a way that I understand that what I now have is something I received. And having received it, I make it my own, even though it is not mine, but God's. The element of pride and self-conceit is absent here because I know that what has been given to me belongs to God. Grace brings with it this kind of assurance and security. Whatever I might be able to accomplish through my own efforts will never be perfect or complete. It will be marked by corruption and death. For at any moment I can fall from the place to which I had risen. This happens to the extent that I think I am the one who brought about this work or that I attained something And because I believed it to be mine, I can easily lose it because of my pride and ego. But with the gift of grace, I perceive that God has given this to me, that I discovered it within myself quite by surprise. I found it placed within me. In the same way that the evil one comes at night and sows his tares, and you find them in the morning, so too does the great God come when night covers all things. That is, when you are covered by ignorance, He places the gift of grace within you, and you see that you are rich, even though you yourself are poor and have nothing. After this, St. Maximus continues to develop his thought, saying the following. The way of ascetic practice does not suffice by itself for the perfect liberation of the mind from the passions, so that it might be able to pray without distraction, unless such practice is succeeded by various spiritual contemplations. Ascetic practice frees the mind only from licentiousness and hate, while spiritual contemplations rid it both of forgetfulness and ignorance, and in this way the mind will be able to pray as it ought. St. Maximus, the Confessor, Chapters on Love. Here the Confessor continues the idea he introduced to us in the previous chapter, presenting it to us in a way that is simple and easy to understand. When he speaks of the mind being liberated from the passions, He is referring to the passions that affect the intelligible aspect of the soul because there are other passions that affect our power of desire and anger which the mind internalizes since the reverberations of repercussions, we might say, reach to the level of the mind and influence it. But the passions that the mind primarily suffers from are the more spiritualized passions, that is, intelligible passions that are more proper to the mind. Up to this point, you saw where the keeping of the commandments leads you and where you are led by spiritual reading and contemplation. If you want your mind to be completely free of the passions so that it is free of their impulses and movements, so that the mind does not incline to them, so that it contains no thought or mental image whatsoever and is completely dispassionate and unmoving with respect to the passions, then ascetic practice does not suffice. Ascetic practice consists largely in the keeping of the commandments. It is the human effort 
that we saw in the fourth chapter with the words, ascetic practice does not suffice. It is as if the confessor is telling us, do not seek to prop yourself up based on the things that you do. Whatever you do will be human. And just as flesh will not inherit the kingdom of the heavens, neither will any of your human efforts. In order for your mind to be free of the passions so that it might be able to attain to prayer that is undistracted, it has to rise to spiritual contemplations. This means that the grace of God must come in response to your efforts and labors, to your ascetic practice, and thereby raise you up by means of contemplations, making you able to receive a spiritual life. To be sure, even a person adhering solely to ascetic practice can experience spiritual contemplations because God loves everyone and to everyone he gives forms of consolation. But to the same degree that spiritual reading and contemplations are more abundant, to that same degree will one acquire greater purity, love, and a mind free of distractions. When you live a contemplative spiritual life, when your spirit is in a state of continual contemplation, your mind is never disturbed by distractions. But when you are living in the midst of the world, you struggle to find a few minutes to contemplate God. And afterwards, you quickly fall back into the patterns and routines of everyday life. The same thing can happen to a monk in a monastery. He too can become caught up in the mundane activities and daily routines, just like people living in the world. Such a life is not necessarily sinful. It's simply the way of the way life in the world is. This is why I have to have a succession of spiritual contemplations in my life. We all have a great need for inner spiritual experiences of God, of revelations given to us directly from God in such a way that these revelations become something uniquely my own, something that I understand and which I recognize and which I wholly possess in love. This is what is it means for something to be mine and in this case, what I love and possess and understand and feel is obviously God himself. In this way, my life becomes bound up with the life of God. In the practical life, asceticism is of the utmost importance. Yet, even though asceticism is a spiritual means to a spiritual end, it remains a virtue of the body. There are many different kinds of ascetic practices, such as the guarding of the mind, but this is purely an activity, an exercise. It is not itself an element of the spiritual life. It is something that by itself is incomplete. It is something that takes place on the level of human effort. Asceticism is not an end in itself. It is not something that enables me to stand before God. In fact, it ensures me no place before God. All it can do is attract God, if I may put it this way. Any form of asceticism not undertaken for this purpose will remain outside the field of divine encounter. It will never enable me to receive God. My asceticism, therefore, must always take place in relation to God in order to attract God and draw him closer to me. And I attract God when I confess by means of my asceticism, my sinfulness and my weaknesses and my incapacity. And when I acknowledge that on my own, I am absolutely unable to do anything spiritual. If I should receive divine contemplations, then my asceticism has the following meaning and makes me say, God, you gave me this experience of grace, this contemplation, but I am still who I am. I am earth, ash, clay, soil, flesh, naked, nothing at all. It is only you who make me rich. My life without you is like the world without light. Nothing has form or shape. Nothing is clearly visible. I can't see anything anywhere. Things vanish from before my eyes. They're lost, and I am lost without you. I find the substance of my being, the meaning of my life, only in the light of your grace, only when you bestow upon me these spiritual insights and contemplations, which is the revelation of your presence, the contemplation and vision of you. Thus it is through ascetic practice that I discover my identity, it is through asceticism that I come to recognize who I am, my nature, that I am earth and ash. And I express my humble condition by being grateful for the gift that God has given me. And when God sees my gratitude, he is moved to give me even more. But asceticism by itself is not able to raise me up even a little bit above the earth if I do not have the experience of ongoing contemplations. 
Ascetic practice frees the mind only from licentiousness and hate. This is the limit of ascetic practice, namely to free the mind from licentiousness and hate, which means to be in a state or condition in which one refrains from evil. Licentiousness is essentially a loss of control, a loss of the self, in which one is overpowered and dominated by the need to surrender to something, to have no control over it. To be freed from such a condition means that your mind returns to a state of self-governance so that it can protect itself and direct itself toward its proper goal, which is God. An example will be helpful. In monasticism, we have the virtue of virginity, which in its deeper sense is a perfect state of union with God. According to some people, the Greek word virginity actually means union or coupling with God. In the world, we have marriage, not sin, not fornication, but marriage, which is freedom from licentiousness. Sin, on the other hand, is always a form of licentiousness. Marriage is many things, but in this context, it is a life that is measured, tempered, and balanced. It is something that requires self-restraint. In monasticism, we have virginity. In marriage, we have self-restraint. In the monastery, we do not own or acquire personal property. In marriage, there is the proper and necessary use of personal property, but not greed, which again signals a loss of control, a form of licentiousness, for which there is never any justification, neither in monastic or married life. In married life, a person can be free from licentiousness and passions, but he will nonetheless remain in the midst of worldly things. The complete liberation from such things is found only in monastic life. As for the question of hate, we already touched on this in the second chapter when we spoke about desire. Hate is the opposite of desire. Desire attracts the mind, exerting a kind of magnetism on it to the extent that one likes and is drawn to something. Hate also inclines the mind in a certain way, but against something so that we are opposed to or repelled by it. Freedom from licentiousness unites the mind with itself. It brings about an inner unification of our spiritual powers. Freedom from hate liberates the mind from every external element that either consumes us, makes us react, or places ourselves in opposition to it in the wrong way and for the wrong reasons. In other words, the mind needs to be simplified. It needs to rise above these things to remain within itself, being neither attached to things nor repelled by them. Because if the mind is divided because of situations, circumstances, or people, if it is not inwardly united to the body of the church, and if it does not experience the communion of the church, then it cannot experience communion with God, but to the contrary falls away from such communion. Such a mind is separated from the body of Christ. But by means of ascetic practice, the mind is freed to turn to God, although, as we said, Ascetic practice by itself is simply the beginning, a prerequisite or a presupposition. While spiritual contemplations rid it both of forgetfulness and ignorance. It is well known that for someone to attain to a spiritual life, he must reach a level of forgetfulness and ignorance. He must forget, in other words, his own individual experience, his own way of seeing the world, the things he desires, and in short, he must forget whatever he has previously experienced. He must become ignorant of all things, as if nothing existed for him. In this passage, however, the words forgetfulness and ignorance have a completely different meaning. Here, forgetfulness and ignorance signify forgetfulness and ignorance of God. To be free of such forgetfulness is in fact to recall or remember something, because forgetfulness separates a person from an experience. When I recall, for example, a time when I had fallen into sin, it means that the sin continues to live within me. Conversely, to forget the sin means that I am no longer in possession of it. I no longer have the experience of it. It is no longer active within me. In this way, forgetfulness is related to knowledge based on experience. Thus, the person who has not reached contemplation has experiential ignorance of God. He has no feeling for God, but only complete forgetfulness. He has nothing, in other words, on the basis of which he might remember God. And what could he recall or remember if he has never seen God? 
if God has not revealed himself to him, if he has never experienced God's love or goodness within himself. Again, to be rid of such forgetfulness means to receive inner experiential knowledge. The phrase, to be rid of ignorance, means that spiritual reading and contemplation imbue the mind with knowledge. They make the mind participate in the life of God, granting it union with God. We therefore have two things, participation in God and experiential knowledge, that is the understanding and comprehension of God who becomes an inseparable part of my being and indeed through my mind, through recollection, because it is through the mind that I am united to God. Asceticism assists our mind in remaining undistracted by its own inner movements and by things outside itself. Contemplation, on the other hand, assists not only in preserving an undistracted state of mind, but unites the mind with God. The result is that the mind will be able to pray as it ought. Union and acquaintance with God are walking together with God, which is the direct and immediate apprehension of God, enable the human person to pray in a manner consistent with the teachings of the fathers of the church. This means that prayer becomes communion with God, the rapture of the mind to God, and union with him. When this happens, the person seems to be living in the world, but in reality is living in heaven. In the next chapter, St. Maximus leads us to greater heights. Initially, he told us how we become enslaved to material things and what liberates us from them. He told us what the keeping of the commandments delivers us from and the states we attain through spiritual reading and contemplation. Now he returns to the question of prayer because prayer has a direct and immediate relation to love. He has already told us about the activity of prayer among those on the level of practice and again on the level of contemplation. Now he tells us about the heights that prayer reaches when it is offered from each of these two ways. There are two supreme states of pure prayer, one corresponding to those pursuing the practical life, the other to those who experience contemplation. The first arises in the soul from fear of God and good hope, the second from desire for God and total purification. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love. To continue, the meaning of pure prayer has the same sense here that is given to it by all the fathers. Pure prayer means prayer that is free of thoughts, prayer that does not introduce any outside elements. It contains no mental forms, shapes, or images. Pure prayer is not the personal property of monks or a small group of individuals. It is for everyone. It is the one activity that is the most fitting to the human person. Every human being is called to the wedding feast of the Lord, and thus every human being lives in order to practice pure prayer. It is the most simple practice or activity that a person can undertake. Of course, it is another matter entirely if the person has become accustomed to allowing his mind to wander about and be tyrannized by thoughts, so that when he turns to prayer, he does so with a head filled with distractions and thus cannot engage in pure prayer. According to St. Maximus, there are two states of pure prayer. The first, he says, is characteristic of those engaged on the level of practice, while the second is characteristic of contemplatives, that is, those who seek divine contemplations. The person committed to ascetic practice reaches the highest state of pure prayer through the fear of God and with good hope. The worldly person, on the other hand, experiences the absence of God, the negation of God, and this can happen even among those who have been freed from licentiousness and hatred. They may still be without any awareness or consciousness of God who remains absent from their lives. God is present everywhere, yet such a person cries out, Where is God for me? Where is my God? He searches for God. His soul is in agony. He hopes to encounter God but he lacks the ability to lay hold of God. He lacks the fullness of God and remains in a state of incompletion. After he says his prayers, he returns to the same old conditions of his life. When he's done praying, perhaps his wife will say, we need more money. We're having trouble paying the bills and buying groceries. Should we take out a loan? Should we start buying things on credit? Maybe we should rent our part of our home, rent out part of our home. Thus he is confronted by continual cares, upsets, 
and anxieties. And this is why he fears God, and it is this kind of fear that moves him to pray, which often becomes the only reason he ever prays. But will he ever be able to pray like this? A person truly fears God when his whole mind, his whole sense of self-awareness, is filled with the feeling and experience of his smallness. If this fear is lacking, the hope of salvation is lost, since the person no longer knows who he is or what he truly wants and needs. The fear of God is the unceasing stance of the person before God, shaped by his true knowledge and recognition of God's greatness and holiness. But when I do not have true fear of God, I think that God is there simply to respond to my requests, to solve my problems, and for me to simply keep carrying on in the same way. This means I am devoid of the knowledge of God, that I have not understood that God himself is absent from my life and that God is transcendent beyond all things and infinitely beyond me. God is unapproachable, incomprehensible, beyond anything I could ever imagine. So how then is it possible for me not to fear him? This is why the fear of God is necessary for everyone who is on the path to salvation and thus is necessary for everyone. To be sure, the fear of God ultimately assumes the form of love, which casts out all fear. Not, however, in the sense that love displaces fear, but rather that love in a certain way superabounds in the soul and governs the person's life. This is a condition of fulfillment, whereas previously the soul knew only the feeling of lack. Alongside fear, the person engaged in ascetic practice also has what St. Maximus calls good hope. To the extent that those engaged in ascetic practice experience the presence of things in the world, and to the extent that their minds are filled by that presence, they experience the absence of God. They sense that they do not have him. Not having God, but having faith in him and loving him and exercising this or that virtue, they have the good hope that God will see their labors, their struggles, and that they will receive the good things of God, even if it is only in the coming age. We see this clearly in married life. How does a married person experience God? And how is he or she assimilated to God? With the hope that at some point they will see God, that at some point they will pray as they wish to and be free to do so. For now, however, other things tend to take precedence. Perhaps, I think, my hopes will be realized when my children get a little older, when they won't require so much time and attention. But then the children get a little older and other problems arise. Perhaps they fight among themselves, start to use bad language, become disobedient, come under bad influences at school or in the neighborhood, all of which fills your heart with worries and concerns, making it hard to pray in the manner that we have described. At the same time, the wife or husband may become unhappy and start to complain about one thing or another. There may be stress and anxiety about whether or not tomorrow will be better than today. Meanwhile, the hope of turning to God in prayer continues to recede into an indefinite future. Now I say, at some point before God takes me from this life, before I die, I will make time for prayer. You see, then, how difficult it is for a married person to find time for prayer, how hard it is to find time and have peace of mind when one does find time, since the cares and anxieties of life are many and do not cease. This is not the fault nor even the choice of the married person. It is simply the nature of life in the world. A married man is concerned about the affairs of the world and how he can please his wife, and thus his interests are divided. But the unmarried man is concerned about the work of the Lord and how he can please the Lord. 1 Corinthians 7, 32-33. The apostle says that the same is true for the unmarried woman, and both can find their fulfillment in God. Ignorance and absence of God, however, are not things that are found only among those who are married, but also in every monk or nun who continues to be attached to material things, who clings to his or her own self-will, desires, attitudes, and thoughts. Such a person remains on the level of outward ascetic practice. He or she is satisfied with the external forms of asceticism so that even prayer becomes routine and mechanical. 
Such a person is bound to the earth, does not look toward the purpose and goal of monastic life, about which St. Maximus speaks so clearly. Of course, it is assumed that since we are monks, we live without self-will, without personal property, without desires, without individual and self-isolating ways of looking at the world. This is true monasticism, and it should be true of every monk and nun. To live any other way is to be worldly, an imposter, and someone who makes a mockery of the true people of God. The second arises from desire for God and total purification. On the other hand, whoever lives a life of contemplation, whoever is a true monk, does not fear and hope as the point of departure for his ascent to the highest level of pure prayer. Instead, he begins from divine love and the greatest purity. Why? Because he has been freed from his attachments to the things of the world. These are the presuppositions on the basis of which human beings are raised upward to God. But what is divine love? Love means being overwhelmed and conquered by what you love. It is the feeling for and internalization of the beloved person. Let's say, for example, that you love someone who lives in America. Even though this person is far away, you live with that person and experience them as if they were present with you in your very embrace. The same thing happens with divine love. I experience God so much that it's like I am with him always, like I live with him. But this like is not a metaphor. It is a reality. Yes, whereas I am body and spirit, God is spirit, but divine love exists only where God exists. There is no love without another person. And for me, this person is God, who's always faithful, true, and present to me. Thus, I can say that I am possessed by divine love in as much as I am filled by God, in as much as God has conquered me, overwhelmed me, inebriated me with his love, and God has conquered me by virtue of my total purification, which he brought about in my mind and also in my heart. Divine love is thus a powerful feeling of the presence of the beloved person. Total purification is nothing other than myself, my true self, which has been established in this state by divine grace. Now I am a receptive vessel. Now I am able to receive the presence of God. I am ready, pure, and I can say, God, you are so close to me. I love you, and I feel your presence every day. St. Maximus subsequently tells us about the marks or signs of the two supreme states of pure prayer so that we are able to differentiate them from each other. The marks of the first type are the withdrawing of one's mind away from all the ideas and images of the world. And inasmuch as God is present to the mind, as indeed he is, the person makes his prayers without distraction or disturbance. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love 2.6. To continue, Elder Emilia Nos, needless to say, it is difficult for me to live with attachments to things and at the same time to want to be free of them. Nonetheless, St. Maximus says that it is possible for me to concentrate my mind, to withdraw it from the things it is attached to, and to forget them all. I do this by removing my mind and raising it beyond visible things and beyond ideas, images, and concepts, so that I have the sense of standing in the presence of God. I should have not only a sense of this, but also believe that I am truly standing before God. My mind does not see God at this point. It has not yet entered a state of contemplation, which is the supreme response to me from God. It is God's embrace of me, so that I feel him holding me tightly, so that I experience his beauty and subsequently understand that God is present to me. It is not yet any of this, but I believe and I hope that at some point this is what I will experience. And so I withdraw my mind from everything and place it before God, as if God were before me, as indeed he is. I have to believe that God is present, even if I do not feel his presence. I have to situate my mind as if I do feel God, because God exists and is here with me, near at hand. When I reach the point where I am able to distance myself from the things of the world, then I am able to raise my mind without distraction or disturbance to God. My God, I say, 
here you are, I know it, please help me, give me this or that. Or I may say, I have sinned, forgive me, save me, have mercy on me. This is the highest summit that I can reach when I follow the way of ascetic practice. These efforts that I make constitute my disentanglement from every material object and thought. Standing before God in this way, I come to share in his divine energies, which are God's response to my efforts, because each of us has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that, 1 Corinthians 7, 7. Thus I receive my gift, I receive joy and gladness, and I drink from the spring of water that wells up to eternal life, John 4, 14. But the person whose mind is engaged in contemplation drinks and becomes inebriated from the torrent of divine delight. He is submerged entirely within light and becomes a single light with it, becoming holy God, as St. Maximus says in what follows. The marks of the second type are that at the very onset of prayer, the mind is taken hold of by the divine and infinite light and is conscious neither of itself nor of any other being whatsoever except of him who through love brings about such brightness in it. St. Maximus, the Confessor, Chapters on Love, 2.6. At this point, we have the taking up or rapture of the mind. We see that the contemplative person enters into the life of God, but here he is not the actor, but is passively acted on by God. The contemplative person has completely surrendered himself to God, and therefore God is able to do with him whatever he likes. At the very onset of prayer, this means at the initial impulse to or for prayer, when the mind is free of the passions, when it is pure, which means when it is empty, then attracts God to itself. But because in essence, this attraction is a movement from God, in reality, it means a movement toward God. This is why we speak of the ascension or elevation of the mind without meaning that we on our own ascend in our thoughts to God, but rather that God takes us up, that God seizes and carries up our mind. Thus the mind acquires at the very onset of prayer, the initial impulse of prayer that is completely free of thoughts. In this moment, in this initial impulse, as the person praying passively undergoes divinization, the mind is taken up by divine and infinite light in the same way that all things that have come to be within infinite light themselves become light and luminous and thus cannot be distinguished from the light, or in the same way that objects burning in a fire themselves become fire, so too does the person become God, because in a certain way he has been absorbed by God. The mind is caught up at the very onset of prayer, because it contains no thoughts or images because it is empty, and there is nothing to tie it to the earth. Just as a balloon naturally rises upwards, so too is the mind impelled upward, being caught up by God. This is the moment of contemplation that we spoke of earlier. It is not as if the mind were making haste in any particular direction, since it is limited on all sides, but instead it is caught up, having no consciousness of itself, nor of anything else from which it has been separated. It is aware only of God, who through his love imbues the mind with light, with illumination, with a superabundant outpouring of grace. This is something that the mind experiences, which it undergoes passively, for it is God who is acting, not the mind. In this way, I simply receive the ray of light of the spirit, the outpouring and overflow of life, which is actualized by God. Then being moved by the principles, the logi, Around God, the mind receives impressions that are clear and distinct. St. Maximus, 2.6, Chapters on Love. To continue, then, that is, when the mind has been caught up to the heaven by the Holy Spirit, it receives impressions that are clear and distinct. What are these impressions? Like the word emphasis, the senses of highlighting, stressing, or accenting something. Here it means that God appears with great strength and intensity, all the more so now that the mind has been drawn up closely, so closely to him. The addition of the prefix I am in the word impression or em in the word emphasis means that 
one thing is appearing or being manifested within another, that one thing appears within something else. It's as if I have a mirror and the image or impression of a face or object appears within it. That face or object which I see in the mirror appears to be a living, vital reality. It takes on flesh and blood, we might say, even though it is not present in or on the surface of the mirror. I see it as being present there. You're standing over there, but I see you here in the mirror. Something similar happens with these impressions that are made in the mind. When I experience them, I receive the revelation, the knowledge, the contemplation, the manifestation of God as present. I acquire a certain spiritual mode through which the invisible and immaterial God is manifested in my soul in a manner that enables me to experience and know Him. God becomes palpable, perceptible, revealing Himself as the one who is. Lightning strikes in the distance, but I hear the sound of it right here. The source of rain is far off, yet raindrops fall on my head. These things become known to me, they are present to me. I feel and experience the terror of the thunder and the rain which surrounds me. So too do I experience and perceive the joy and delight of the living presence of God. I have within me the personal revelation of God through Christ in the Holy Spirit. When we want to turn toward God by means of a more contemplative mode, with a disposition to delight in God and be filled by Him, we need to acquire His clear and distinct impressions. For it is then that God shines within us. It is then that He becomes a reality in the mirror of our souls, no longer an unknown God, but rather one who is known to us intimately. When this happens, our life is filled with energy, strength, and stability, because we have a personal experience of God. Our life is no longer a human or psychological life, but a spiritual life, and thus we have reached the stage where we can talk about life in the Spirit. What does life in the Spirit mean, or life according to the activity of the Holy Spirit? Life in the Spirit means that we have, been, we have given a place to and a mode by which and the right for the Holy Spirit to operate within us, to fill us and to make us divine human children of the Heavenly Father. Prior to this state, we are but children, doing nothing but playing around, spending all our time laughing and crying, but not experiencing God. This is because God is not like some kind of acquaintance with whom I have some kind of connection, but is rather someone whom I either have accepted or rejected. I am either a spiritual person or I am not. Between the two, there is no intermediate state. No human activity or accomplishment, no way of life or particular place can give our life any kind of substance or content if this experience of the Holy Spirit is lacking. This is the only thing we would say that is a worthy pursuit for the person of faith. This is the only thing that is worth his time and effort. This is the reason why we repent, why we rise up after we have fallen, why we engage in ascetic practices, and why we do the things we do. From this comes the well-known saying of all the saints, namely, that the aim of every prayer is the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. When we acquire the Holy Spirit, the Spirit enters our being and operates within us. The Holy Spirit enters into us because He recognizes us as His own proper dwelling place and so moves and acts freely as if in his own home. Whatever I do is solely for this purpose. Prior to attaining to this state, I am simply a person who lives outside the house of the Father because I do not have a real relationship with God, who for me is not a living reality. He might be alive to everyone, as indeed he is, but for me he is dead. He is a God who does not exist. Because the experience of these impressions of God is so strong, so emphatic, some people understand them to be a proof for the existence of God. For such people, to say that I have an impression of God means that I have proof about the reality of God. If someone asks, who has seen God? I can say, I have seen him. Even if no one else has seen him, I have seen him. How? God is so alive within me, his presence within me is so powerful, it is as if I have seen him, even though my physical eyes have seen nothing. 
To have an impression of God then means that I have within me clear proofs of the presence of God, but the meaning or character of these proofs will vary from person to person. But what is important for us is that with, within us, God is imaged, rendered present, is present, and is revealed to us. Thus I am mingled together with God. I fully live the experience of God so that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, Galatians 2.20. Should I utter a difficult truth? For the most part, we reach only the first step, if we even make it there at all, when we decide once in a while to pray. Why is this so? Because we are still worldly people who have done little more than promise to live a spiritual life. Usually something minor happens and it's enough to upset and trouble us. If someone, for example, asks to see me and I neglect to do so immediately, or if a few days go by before I do so, well, then you'll see the reaction. And if others ask him, why didn't you remind him? He'll say, why should I remind him? Am I the only one he seems to forget all the time? He remembers everyone else. And if I'm away for a month, this is all he'll think about. He'll get all worked up about the fact that I forgot. He'll say I don't care about him, that I'm deliberately ignoring him. But before I return, he might start saying to himself, oh, how wrong I've been. I should have reminded him. I'll remind him after he gets back. I will say I'm sorry for the terrible thoughts I had. And he'll go on and on wrestling with this. This is how the worldly mind works. What kind of impression of God does such a person have within himself? The only impression he has is of his own ego, his problems, his hurt feelings, his bitterness, and all his worldly cares and concerns. How enslaved we all are. But how different things are when God frees us from all of this, when, that is, we understand the heights to which we have been called. But you can recognize and understand and agree with all of this, and yet the next time something happens, it will be as if you hadn't heard a single word I've just said. So we fall into this trap time and again, and thus become the most miserable of creatures in existence. To see a monk who is unhappy or who has failed in his life is a sorry sight indeed. At least a life of ascetic practice is legitimate and justifiable, but to be a monk and live in futility and falsehood is tragic. But whoever has attained to pure prayer receives clear and distinct impressions of God which make him cry out and say, this is my God, this is my Lord and King. And thus we bear witness to what we have seen and heard. We see and we hear what we have sought for, and whereas we sought for it in heaven, we found it within ourselves. For the kingdom of heavens is within you. Luke seventeen twenty one. What anyone loves, he surely holds on to, and spurns everything that hinders his way to it so as not to be deprived of it. And the one who loves God cultivates pure prayer and thus throws off from himself every passion which hinders it. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love, 2.7. In this chapter, we see the practical outcome of what was stated in the previous chapters. It's as if St. Maximus has anticipated our concerns and questions, so that we do not say to him, All of this is very well and good, but what are we supposed to do? Tell us very simply in practical terms, since up until now things have been very theoretical. I myself have not seen God and understand nothing of what you've said. What am I to do? What anyone loves, he surely holds on to. Here, the sense of holds on to means I firmly possess something or someone, as if I'm holding someone strongly by the hand, or I am attached to something or it to me. It means my whole being is absorbed by the thing that I love, that I am completely preoccupied with it. Whatever thing or person I love, I hold on to with all my strength. I cleave to it and I bind it inseparably to my existence and spurns everything that hinders his way to it so as not to be deprived of it. I disdain and despise whatever gets in the way of what I love and which prevents me from making it my own because I don't want to lose it. I don't want to lose the tie that I have to it. From this it follows that if I say I love God while in fact my, love, my real loves are elsewhere, 
then I am babbling empty words. If what we have just said holds true for the love of things that are earthly and common, how much more should it be true of the love of the Heavenly Father? Do I love God? If I do, then I should be closely bound to Him, especially in my mind, and at the same time I should disdain whatever impedes or compromises that love. Monastic life is nothing other than the disdain for everything that impedes and compromises the love of God. When the fathers of the church speak about the love of God, they do not merely contrast it with sin, but with everything. Of course, having experienced the negative outcome of sin, we protect ourselves from it. But it is better to be motivated by the kinds of good dispositions and desires that arise in our soul through prayer or the spiritual reading of Holy Scripture. When this happens, our conscience can move us to identify and disdain exactly what is hindering us from God, what is preventing us from being united to Him. God is always on the opposite shore, as it were, of where things are. God is over here, and everything else is over there. Thus, the monk is someone who casts aside every element, internal or external, that impedes his relationship with God. The monk is someone who seeks to remove every secondary, non-essential goal, every impulse of self-interest, every disposition towards something in this world, because all these things represent attachments of the mind or the heart, and all push God out of our life. Unless, of course, God has clearly called me to do something concrete, but here I stress the word clearly, uh, not vaguely or possibly, and not according to what I think I should do, nor what someone else tells me to do. If God has clearly determined something for me, then I can be sure it is not my own will, because the Lord himself will be acting and not me. But the point is that there are two moments here that we need to keep in sight. First, the spurning of all things, and second, attachment to God. Do you see then the great importance in the unceasing communion of man with God? Because what does it mean when we say, my spirit has followed closely behind you? Psalm 62, 9. What else but something that does not cease for eternity? But is such a thing possible? Of course it is. Of this you should have no doubt. If it weren't possible, we would have to say that the entire history of the church is nothing but lies that the whole of Holy Scripture, all the fathers of the church, and the centuries-old experience and witness of monasticism have all been nothing but a giant fraud. And for you to know that communion with God is possible, all you have to do is experience that to which the conscience of the church witnesses, which is witnessed also by the ongoing journey of monasticism. If, however, I sense that something is interrupting my communion with God, then I must choose either the cross of obedience, which will transform me into an instrument of grace and enable me to operate in a special way in order to reach my goal, or to set aside that which is interrupting my communion with God so that I can be alone, which means all one, with the one God. Then I can do all things because everything becomes part of my movement toward God, Everything becomes a step on the journey leading me into the presence of God until the moment when I will be attached to Him. How does this attachment come about? How does the mind adhere to God? And the one who loves God cultivates pure prayer. If I love God, I am concerned about only one thing, namely pure prayer, because nothing else unites me to God as much as this. As we have said, pure prayer is prayer in which the mind contains no thoughts or images, and he throws off from himself every passion which hinders it. Let's say that someone wants to be a doctor, but this is not what his father wants him to do. He'll get up and say, I'm leaving. I'll get a job and pay for medical school on my own. He abandons his father so that he can become a doctor. Someone else will end an acquaintance or friendship if they see it has become a problem between themselves and the person they love. The meaning of this chapter is clear. What you do in your everyday life, what everyone does, what basic logic dictates, 
is what in this instance you will also do in your spiritual life. Even if you have never seen God or heard him, even if you have nothing, no proof, no impression, no experience, no faith, no hope, even if you are a sinner and a miserable wretch, whatever you are and whatever state you are in, do in this instance what everyone does. Do you love God? That is, do you want to love God? Devote yourself to pure prayer. Commit yourself to this goal and remove from your life everything that is an obstacle to it. Cast aside every care, every worry, every desire, all your passionate attachments to the things of this world, everything that preoccupies and troubles your mind, and give yourself to prayer. If you do, you will be amazed at how simple and easy this is. Second, you need simply to start praying. Don't think about the results or outcome of your prayer. As the apostle says, blessed is the man who does not judge himself in the midst of what he is doing, Romans 14, 22. Simply pray, since this is what God wants you to do. Pray and gently set aside whatever enters your mind during the time of prayer. Whatever tries to enter should not be permitted entrance. Do not allow it to linger and build its nest in your mind. But if your mind is bound to the things of the world, if you desire this or want that, or if you're seeking after a third thing and there's a fourth thing you love and a fifth which attracts you, and on and on, it's like having relationships with multiple people when you're supposed to be single and unattached. In seven short chapters, essentially seven short paragraphs, St. Maximus has given us so much. He is inclusive and methodological, but methodological is an orthodox way. His thoughts and words are not generated by ordinary human reason or rationality. Neither do they come from any kind of system. He strikes in a timely and incisive manner all the critical points, making him an expert surgeon in the anatomy of the human spirit. Chapter 3. The one who throws off self-love, which is the mother of the passions, will very easily, with God's help, set aside the others, such as anger, grief, resentment, and all the rest. But whoever is under the control of the former is wounded, even if unwillingly by the latter. Self-love is passion for the body. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love, 2.8 There is only one thing that can drag me down from my ascent to God. There is only one thing that can overturn every single spiritual accomplishment, that can turn a saint into a sinner and indeed a devil, that can take whatever is good and beautiful and noble in the eyes of God and reduce it to something wretched, base, and utterly lost, namely, self-love, which is passion for the body. Here we understand the body in a manner consistent with the Father's, so that it means the bodily mind, like the mind of the flesh. It is the dark earthliness of the heart, the orientation and disposition of the mind toward things that are not suitable to the spirit. In this chapter, St. Maximus does not distinguish between body and soul, because such a distinction would have no meaning or relation to the passion of self-love. Self-love is something that arises in the soul. It obviously stems more from an inward condition than from an outward bodily one. But because self-love most frequently manifests itself through the body or through our attachment to the body, where its movements and activities are so clearly manifested, St. Maximus uses the more inclusive word body. If someone attains the heights of spiritual life, and subsequently falls, it will be because of self-love. This is because, as I've told you many times, self-love is the turning of the mind back to the self, which at the same time signals our rejection and abandonment of God. St. Maximus is not speaking about selfishness or hypocrisy or pride or vainglory or arrogance or conceit, but about the ego, which alone is able to impede and block our movement toward God. And when we have been raised up to God, self-love is the only thing that can drag us down from heaven and cast us back to earth. This is why he says that we are absolutely safe only when we throw off self-love. Looking at it from another point of view, self-love is the root 
from which all the passions sprout up within us. Like weeds, if you pull up one, more will follow, since the root system is below the surface. But what exactly is self-love? It is an attitude of mind, a disposition, and above all, a judgment, which is filtered through the prism of the ego. It is like a film that has covered the eyes of my heart and prevents me from seeing the world clearly because everything is distorted through the lens of the ego. Whatever I think or see or desire that has its origin in my ego or self-will will surely separate me from God. Only the denial of my ego can prevent me from being violated and wounded by the passions. One can be perfectly purified of the passions, but such purity can be lost and all the passions can quickly return. All I need to do is return my focus to myself and the passions will be there waiting for me. You can see from this point of view that self-love is not a passion, by which I mean it is not one passion among the many passions, but is rather the origin or starting point of them all. Just as God is the beginning and principle of every good, so too is self-love the beginning and principle of everything that is bad. Why did the devil fall? Because of self-love. The devil did not, at that point, have any passion within him. He was still an angel, and thus without passions. God did not create evil, which means that self-love in and of itself is not evil. But it becomes evil when it is identified with my ego, when I see the world and God himself through the distorting glass of my self-regard, my self-will. From the moment that Lucifer began to imagine that he would be God, he fell. When the human person made a similar mistake, he also fell and obscured the image of God that he bore within himself. Thus, self-love is the only thing we need to be vigilant about. In our lives, we are all vulnerable to the extent that we live without discernment, lacking any kind of objective or accurate judgment when it comes to ourselves. But let us return to the text. Having shown us the starting point for every fall and passion, St. Maximus turns his attention to the one who actually brings about such falls, who tempts us throughout our whole lives, namely Satan. According to the fathers of the church, Satan is not a metaphor or abstraction, but an actual personal entity. If we deny that the evil one is a personal entity and think that he is some sort of impersonal state or condition like an evil habit or inclination, we will encounter no end of problems when we try to read the writings of the fathers not to mention the New Testament. Only when we acknowledge that the evil one is a personal entity can we even begin to solve such problems. To the extent that we make such an acknowledgement, we can resolve various difficulties in our lives, but it also enables us to safeguard ourselves from the devil who knows how to incite and stir up our ego. This is why St. Maximus says the following. Either the demons tempt us themselves, or they arm those who do not fear the Lord against us. They tempt us themselves when we are alone, away from others, just as they tempted the Lord in the desert. They tempt us through others when we associate with them, as they tempted the Lord through the Pharisees. It is for us to look to our example and beat them back on both fronts. St. Maximus, the Confessor, Chapters on Love 2.13 How do the demons tempt us? either directly by themselves or indirectly through other human beings. It is important to know when it is the former or the latter that we are experiencing. The demons themselves tempt us when we are alone, just as they tempted the Lord in the desert. It is when I am alone by myself that the devil comes to tempt me because there is no one else around me. There is the ancient tradition that when someone went into the desert, he went there to fight with the devil. In the same way, monastic life itself has long been seen as an intense, protracted struggle against the evil one. When, on the other hand, I live with others, then the devil comes to tempt me through those around me, just as the Pharisees tested and tried the Lord. In this way, the devil tempts those living in the world through other people, either through personal attacks, false accusations, treachery, and deceit, to mention only a few. For the most part, the greatest spiritual problem facing those living in the world is other people. 
If then I am living in the world together with other people, I must be prepared in order not to be bothered or troubled by them. If I have the right attitude, the right frame of mind with respect to them, I will be able to live a life free of temptations and remain untroubled by what goes on around me. This is why it is necessary to know what we are dealing with and how to prepare ourselves for it. There are people, including monks, who think that the devil is harassing them. As a rule, these people are arrogant and conceited, or they might have a psychological or mental problem, or overactive imaginations, or are simply deluded. The devil does not bother the man or woman living in the world, living among other human beings, or living among monastic brothers and sisters. This only happens when such a person separates himself from society and undertakes to live alone with God. Since it is a given, then, that I live with and have social interactions with others, I must remain completely unaffected and undisturbed by the troubles that will inevitably arise from these interactions. I need to dispose myself in such a way as to be ready to experience anything and everything from them. Difficulties, hardships, stress, temptations, and more. At the same time, I have to set aside all my passions, or at the very least not to act on them, so that they do not disturb me and create additional problems. If I choose a path other than this one, I will not be able to have a spiritual life. Someone else may say hurtful things to me, hurt me physically, may inflict a host of bad things upon me, but he can never actually harm me if I maintain the right attitude to him and to the larger situation. But from the moment I forget or fail to understand the devil's trap, which he has baited with the love or hate I harbor for someone else, with my feelings of attraction or repulsion, triggered either by a smile or a bitter word, you can see what insecure and treacherous ground I am on. Who then does the evil one attack directly? Those who are alone. As we said a moment ago, the sense of alone here is to be by oneself, but there is another meaning operative here, which is to be alone or live alone, not in isolation, but for the sake of someone else. Being alone in this way is the personal encounter of two, as when you'd like to discuss something personal with someone, and the two of you go somewhere where you can be alone. But the relationship we're talking about here is not a social encounter in which two people get together to talk about something. Instead, the other person in this case is someone to whom I belong, someone I worship, I mean God, to whom I stand in the relationship of servant. In addition, this person is the very purpose and goal of my life. He is my fulfillment. I give myself to him. I live alone exclusively with him because only in his person can I be fulfilled and made complete, just as in the case of a married couple for whom there is no room for nor any need of a third party. On their own, the two constitute one person, one flesh. Genesis 2.24 To be alone then means to be alone with someone else toward whom I look and for whom I live and who is everything for me. Thus, when we talk about monasticism or about being alone, when we pray either in one's cell or in the desert, it is not in the sense of any kind of narrow psychological isolation or disconnection, but rather being alone with God. And it is from this perspective that we need to understand our struggle with the evil one. For me to become a monk means that I let go of all preoccupations, all activities, all distractions, so that there exists nothing but me and God, this is because God does not deign to visit souls and unite himself to them when they are not alone in this way, when they are not still, as it says, be still and know that I am God, Psalm 45, 11. Without this kind of practice, there can be no real knowledge of God, no true word of theology, because the word will not reveal God to me. But when I make this practice mine and place myself in the presence of God, then I begin to walk on a path of truth leading to God. Then I begin to live a life in which I see God before me, and only then do I have any right to call myself a monk. And it is only at this point that the evil one will try to make himself my God, and he will try to do this in any way he can, hiddenly, openly, through seduction, cunning, or fear. 
It is for us to look to our example and beat them back on both fronts. What does example mean here? In ordinary language, it means a type or something or characteristic of a person, as when we say, he's an extroverted type or he has a melancholy character. But this is not exactly what St. Maximus means. Here, the word type needs to be taken in a more literal sense, that is, as the outcome or result of the act of striking out a form or shape, and in particular, the result of what has been formed and shaped in a struggle with one's adversaries. We speak, for example, of the types of the nails on the Lord's body, a word which refers to the marks made by the nails, the wounds imprinted on his body from the striking force of the nails. The sound of my feet walking on the marble floor is also a kind of type that is marked out, an acoustic form produced by the striking of my feet. A sketch or a drawing is also a type. Letters, too, such as those punched out by a typewriter, are also types, which is why we have words like typography. A base relief or a carving is also a type that has been produced through similar activity on stone or wood. A seal and the mark or image left by the seal are also types. Thus, a type is the means or agent that produces a result through a process of striking or imprinting on or against something else, having direct and immediate contact with it, which serves as the physical medium for the result or outcome. Since then, a type is the outcome of the activity of marking or striking, we can say that the experience of our life is essentially a type by which I mean it is the result of all the marks and blows and all the factors and influences that have shaped our lives. A person whose spiritual life has not been challenged in this way, who has not endured various blows, will be an immature person, an atypical person who can have no certainty about his future. Only the one who has gone through this process can have the kind of certainty because he has experience and knows where he is going and how to move forward. But a person who has experienced no hardship or adversity in his life, who has never known sorrow or pain, who has never learned to endure the blows of life, whether inflicted by demons or other human beings or simply by life itself, can never have a full and meaningful life. Let's consider more closely the type we are most familiar with, that is the kinds of experiences we have and how we have been shaped and formed by them. Yesterday, for example, I was a little upset because you gave me a rather rude look. The day before that, I was troubled because you had forgotten about me. What type of person am I? Clearly, I am someone who is not alone with God, but who spends all my time involved in the personal affairs of other human beings. I live as a mere mortal creature, just like everyone else, even if I am a monk, monk even if I have been wearing these monastic garments for years, if on the other hand, my experiences were purely spiritual inward, resulting from the struggle of my ego with God, either struggles that my ego won and God lost, or struggles that I lost and God won, which resulted not in my fall, but in my spiritual ascent. Then I am the type of person who is alone with God, who lives solely for God. If someone pays attention to himself, he will see whether he lives with God or merely with other people. Consider the type of person you are, and you'll understand from which side you need to protect yourself. If Satan is troubling you, arm yourself properly, and above all things, be on guard against self-love. If it is other people who trouble you, place yourself spiritually out of reach of harmful contact with them, because they will be around you always constantly subjecting you to temptations and trials and leaving you covered with marks, deeply shaped and changed by their imprintings and impressions. Yet do not think that in your life of social interactions with others, you cannot always be with God. It would be a great mistake to think this. By virtue of these relations, and especially those marked by love and by service or ministry in the church, you cannot be without God. You cannot offer yourself to the world if you yourself are not living in God, because the world wants God, not us. If you hate some people and some you neither love nor hate, 
while others you love only moderately and still others you love very much. Know from this inequality that you are far from perfect love, which lays down that you must love everyone equally. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love, 2.10. The sense of lays down here means that beneath a certain objective category under a particular idea, I establish a foundation, a presupposition, a purpose or a program so that it does not stand apart from its larger context or aim. In this case, perfect love has as its goal that you must love everyone equally. This also serves to move and inspire people, to guide and direct them, because this is what it means to give someone or to have a goal or purpose. Thus, perfect love inspires you. It encourages and exhorts you. It guides you to the place where you can love everyone equally because perfect love is the love of God. This applies to you in your relationships with others. But what about what they do to you? What kind of evil can other people or demons inflict upon you? The answer is given in the following chapter. Those who tempt us with God's permission either arouse the lusts of our soul or stir up our anger or darken our reason or inflict pain on our body or plunder our material goods. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love 2.12. Yerenda Amelia Nos continues, In this chapter, St. Maximus presents us with two things, the threefold division of the human soul into desire, anger, and reason, and the human body. He is not describing the human person so much as a personal entity or agent, but more from the perspective of its passivity, which means in terms of the passions it can have, act upon, or suffer from. The phrase, with God's permission, refers to things that are permitted to take place with God's knowledge and forbearance. With God's permission, that either arouse the lusts of our soul, which means to provoke, incite, or stir up our capacity for desire, or stir up anger, so that we lose the sense of moderation in our judgments or feelings, losing our inner peace and being thrown into a state of turmoil, or darken our reason, which is to confuse and disorder our ability to think clearly so that our minds are blinded, dulled, perverted, seeing black as white and white as black. Let's take some time to go more deeply into the meaning of the phrase, quote, they arouse the lusts of our soul, end quote, which, as we said, means to stir up and incite our capacity for desire. The only thing that I can desire is God. Is this possible? Yes. Of course, in reality, the only thing that I can truly think or understand is God, and when my thinking is absorbed by God, then my spirit is set free and raised aloft with my soul, at which point my power of desire completely surrenders to God. In this way, my desire is honest and genuine in the eyes of God, and when it is bound to Him, it shares in the divine. Otherwise, my desire is fragmented and disordered. It may lead my inner world into darkness, creating still further divisions and fragmentization within my soul so that I am unable to love God. For while God is simple, I have become fragmented, multiple, and complex. How, though, are those who trouble us able to arouse the lusts of our soul? In many ways. For example, if I live in a monastery, the presence of other people awakes within me the longing to live in the wilderness. They incite and inflame this longing, this desire, which appears to be a godly desire, but which can lead to my destruction, to a fall that will mark me for the rest of my life. Or they stir up my desire to return to the world and help people by giving talks and sermons because I have the idea that I am going to save them. My heart is filled with warmth for them. I feel like I love them, that I want to help them. But this seeming ardor is a temptation that God allows me to have because, as we said, God himself tempts no one, although he does permit people to be tempted. This is why St. Maximus says, with God's permission. In this case, the ardent desire I feel is clearly a temptation, and the more it acquires the character of some good or godly need, the more dangerous it becomes, because to that same degree, the deeper truth of it is hidden from my awareness. 
Second, they stir up our anger. The human capacity for what is generally referred to as anger refers to the spirited part of the soul, which is also the spirit or power of aggression. It is that part of us which feels things very deeply and intensely. It is not desire. When I desire something, I don't have it and I want it. But when anger or aggression or the spirited part of my soul is aroused, it is something that I feel, something that I experience, something that I am in possession of. Whatever we have taken into ourselves, whatever we have absorbed into the depths of our feelings, whatever has taken possession of us, especially those things to which our self-will has become habituated, and whatever we believe to be ours will make us lose our balance and control the minute it is provoked and stirred up. Most people live under great stress and pressure as if they were always on a slow boil, always ready to blow up and boil over. Just think what happens when someone else's self-will clashes with yours. Immediately, you get defensive, all worked up, and you want to prove that you are right and justify what you believe to be true or right. Or think about someone you know and care about who turns on you or who betrays you or who abandons you or dies. You will surely be disturbed by these things and feel that person's absence you will likely become extremely upset and lose your inner peace and calm. Third, they darken our reason. In the spiritual world, human rationality can lead us to a state of inertia and inactivity. The spiritual or noetic aspect of the mind seeks to soar aloft, but rationality will always retard its progress. Reason becomes preoccupied with unimportant details, takes many wrong turns, become self-absorbed and impedes the progress of the mind's spiritual work. Thus, when we speak about the spiritual life, we distinguish the noetic from the rational. But when we speak about the life of the passions and the properties of the soul, we normally treat the noetic and the rational together, distinguished from desire and anger. When my mind ascends noetically toward God, then reason or thought is pure, that is, free of any content. As we said earlier, only the empty mind can be taken up by God. On this level, reason does nothing other than simply follow God. In other words, when reason is pure, it is united with the mind. When it is not pure, it becomes a complete counterweight to the mind, darkening the mind's atmosphere, we could say, so that the mind is not able to continue its progress. When this happens, we are filled with idle, and negative thoughts, which when we indulge and feed them become full-blown fantasies. Thus, when the mind, the noetic faculty, is mingled with impure reason, it becomes virtually or functionally non-existent. It's like an eagle that has fallen into a pit of mud and been completely covered by it. And should the mind return to its proper eagle-like condition, should it seek to soar into the heavens, then Either the devil or human beings will seek to drag it down by darkening or otherwise confusing its power of reason. What do the demons and human beings do to us in this regard? They come into conflict with our wishes and desires, or they instill or awaken certain desires within us, both of which have the same result, namely inflaming our disordered desires. Or they concur with and in encourage our attitudes and inclinations, or they disagree with us so that our power of reason becomes darkened. They cover reason's natural brightness with a cloud, which of course you are not able to see and which is often mistaken for clarity and a sense of purpose. But every image or idea that reason is attached to impedes its union with the mind and its vision of God. This is not the cloud upon which God rides in scripture, but a different cloud concealing the evil one. See Isaiah 19.1. Generally speaking, all these things happen on the level of the soul. What happens on the level of the body? They inflict pain on our body or plunder our material goods. If it is the devil who is harassing you, he can strike you, cover your body with bruises, afflict you with sickness, or take away your possessions. People can do the same thing. They can cause you physical pain, either by taking things away from you or by making your life difficult or by reducing you to poverty, hunger, nakedness, 
as well as many other things. We could say that they impose constraints or limits on you so that when you are feeling deprived and diminished, you want only to resist and react and so lose your feeling of peace with God. If, however, you succeed in rising above pain in the sense that you no longer consider it as something evil, but rather as something good, if you consider every difficulty, burden, privation, and pain as a divine visitation, then you will live and be beyond temptations. No one will be able to trouble your spirit. But to the extent that you want to fight back or want to triumph over your troubles, conquer your pain, struggle to regain the things that were lost or taken from you, then you cannot have a relationship with God because this is the very thing that is disrupted by your self-will and resistance. Let's say, for example, you don't have enough to eat. You will learn to say with St. Paul, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances, Philippians 4.11. If I have something to eat, I will eat. If I don't have anything to eat, I won't eat. Am I in good health? I will say, glory to God. Is my health poor? I will still say, glory to God. But the moment I become anxious about my health, wishing only to get better, running around to doctors, taking different kinds of medicines, traveling frantically to foreign countries for experimental procedures, I have lost God. I have become like a top spinning out of control. The same thing happens when I'm unable to understand that I don't need the things that I don't have. Someone took some of my clothes or my things or my money. None of these things is necessary and may be replaced. In different forms, deprivation, privation, and pain constitute basic elements of the spiritual life. A person who resists difficulties or who is afraid of pain or who cannot endure to lose or be deprived of his possessions has lost God. For such a person, God is dead. Conversely, the person who is committed to spiritual struggle must learn not simply to accept physical pain and other difficulties, but must learn to see and understand them as blessings and opportunities for spiritual growth and sanctification. From this point forward, St. Maximus speaks of the person who has begun to make progress in the love of God, which is why we're going to stop here and say something very practical. Let's not fool ourselves. There is no question that God exists. The question is whether or not he exists for us, and he surely doesn't when our lives are devoid of the signs of his presence, the impressions and marks that he leaves on us. At the same time, as we make our way through life, it happens that the world, the evil one, and our ego will leave their own marks on us, their own impressions in our soul. To be sure, we are creatures created from earth, from the world. But this creature of clay is called to be refashioned, to be reborn, just like the aged Nicodemus, who was told by the Lord that he could be born again. We too can be reborn if first we acknowledge and believe that we are earthly beings fashioned from earth, since this is already the beginning of a blessed state of mind. And if second, we strip our mind of all its thoughts, ideas, and images. If we do this, we will see what kind of Lord we worship and understand whose image we are. Then we will know if God exists for us because he will leave his noetic impression on our mind, in our mind. Then we will see the simplicity of our being in the unification of all our physical, cognitive, and spiritual powers. But if we do not return to ourselves, if we do not uncover the spiritual depths of our mind so that we can see where we are going, so that we can be free of all things, then we should not pretend or say that we have even begun to live a spiritual life. What we can do in our everyday life is something very simple. First, we should be careful not to disturb or upset our relations with others, even a little. We should not allow ourselves to be swayed by how much we like or don't like a person, which indicates the degree to which our stance is dependent on that person. For example, someone might speak to me rudely and I ignore him, or someone else might speak to me kindly and I turn and embrace him. In both cases, my responses are determined by the other person, which means that at any moment I can be troubled, become angry, lose my inner peace, or otherwise be thrown off balance because I have no control over what people will say or do to me. 
Thus, if our relations with those around us are not well balanced, we should know that we are of the flesh. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 4. All the more so if we harbor anger or animosity toward another person. We can never be justified if our relations with others are darkened even by the smallest cloud. The second thing we need to do is judge ourselves very strictly in order to see if we are being motivated by self-will, selfish desire, or some other ulterior motive. If we see anything like this within ourselves, we should know that we have the mind of the flesh. Romans 8, 6. Our lives are not governed by the Holy Spirit because we are not united to the will of God. Do we possess within ourselves anything that is our own? If we do, it means that the ego has not completely identified itself with God. We have not yet cleaved to God, as the psalmist says. Psalmist 63, 8. God and the ego are, on the one hand, two different things, but they can become one when and to the extent that neither of them is separated from the other. When they are two, they are strangers to each other. They must become one, being united without confusion, without either one losing its being or personhood. But for me to exist fully and completely with God, I must be without desire for anything else and have no self-will seeking its own interests. If I have any of these things, it means that I am still tied to the earth because these things arise either from my disordered desire, anger, or fallen way of thinking. In such a state, my mind is full of thoughts that constantly drift off to the things I like, the things that interest me. It is these things, not God, to which my thoughts continually return, like a pig who wants nothing more than to return to his little puddle of mud. Let me then be someone without interests, so that for me only God exists. Let me not indulge the impulses of my ego and project them into every situation. When I sense this happening, I will not act on its demands. In this way, I will remain tranquil no matter what is going on around me. I will know true joy and not the impulsive and hollow responses of happiness and sorrow triggered by fleeting and ever-changing circumstances. I will not allow everyday events to upset me or leave their impressions on my soul. I will do my work, perform my duties, go about my business with integrity, but I will not become attached to my job or career. I will give it the time it needs. I will work under God's watchful eyes, knowing that it is simply something God has given me to do. I won't mind if things change or if I am told to do something else in the monastery or if I have to find another job. None of these things will disturb my inner peace. Instead, I will be turned always toward God and I will do all things well without, however, being becoming attached to them. Third, let us seek those moments when we can be alone with God, since these are the most precious and substantive moments of our life. In comparison to these moments, all other moments of life lack substance. In particular, the moments I am speaking of are those hours before the start of the morning service. If we can, let us set aside one, two, three, or four hours every morning. If we do not set aside such time, we will never grow. We will never set down any spiritual roots, and consequently we will have neither real worship nor mystical life. And during the winter months, when the nights are longer, Setting aside three or four hours is not difficult. Our time alone with God and our time in church are mutually dependent. They go together, and truly one cannot exist without the other. Worship is a presupposition for the mystical life because it makes God present. God, the one who exists, becomes present within me through the unfolding of time in worship. And from being present to me, mystical prayer makes God one with me eternally together with me, because such prayer is the continuation of the life of worship. Before the start of the service, if you wish, devote some time to spiritual reading or give yourself to prayer. Whatever you do, it is enough that you are together with God. Nothing should make you think about the world. Nothing should draw you away from God. You should be ever, who should be ever before you, who should fill the whole of your vision and being and in whom you should exult and rejoice in a joy that arises solely 
from an inward vision of God, which in turn will become a pure contemplation of God, a true and clear impression of him in your soul. The time after worship is also important. Socializing, visits, food, laughter, and things like this generally lead us to wander away from the Father, far from the Father's house. Let's not fool ourselves. It is not by accident that meals in the refectory are always served immediately after the service, unless there is a feast when the order is changed. This is done so that when we have finished eating, we can go back to our cells. And you can be sure that when you feel hungry, tired, or are troubled by various difficulties, it is because your souls are holding on to the earth and not to God. When we are turned to God, we feel neither hunger, weariness, heat, cold, or anything like this. We simply feel thankful and grateful to God. So after the service has ended, either go and rest since the body needs to rest or attend to your work as long as you realize that your only true work is the one you undertake for God. If for some reason you cannot keep your mind on God, then instead of running around here and there, eating and drinking and constantly talking, find a task that will help to focus your mind and keep it from being distracted. Work in the garden, work in the tailor shop, work in the wood shop, wherever you want to, but give yourself to your work because for now you are not able to give yourself to God, at least during those hours after the service. At night, after Compline, it is preferable to get some rest so that you can wake up early in the morning, a few hours before the start of the morning service. Unless, of course, you have received a blessing to undertake some kind of spiritual work in your cell after Compline. But to spend the time after Compline socializing and chatting is an activity that comes not from God, but from your self-will and the self-will of others. It's one thing if you have a special blessing to converse with visitors to the monastery, but otherwise you should be resting in preparation for prayer and worship. If you are not silent during the day, if all day long you're running around doing this and that, at night you'll simply sleep. And if you sleep at night, the next day will be empty. It will not be a day in which you can do any spiritual work. And how much more so if you spend the night talking and doing other things. To have a substantive day and night is something that comes from a true inward spiritual root. If we live in this way, we will discover the spiritual depth of the mind and begin to make progress toward God. When we struggle and work for the sake of God, then we can say we have the right to ask for the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we will only be uttering words about the Holy Spirit without ever being reborn in the Spirit, without ever being salted by His fire. And there will be no salt. Every sacrifice will be salted with salt. If there is no fire of difficulties, no struggle with life's blows, and there will be no fire, all will be salted with fire if the mind does not rise upwards. See Mark 9, 49. And there will be no spirit if there is no salt and fire, that is, if there is no genuinely felt experience of inward spiritual life. We should not forget that our prayers begin with the prayer to the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, whom the Son sends to us from the Father. Let this be something that always enables us to collect and focus our mind, that will remind us of our true place in relation to the Holy Spirit. If, on the other hand, our place is false, then no matter how many times we say, Heavenly King, Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who is everywhere present, the one who is everywhere present will not be present for us. We may cry out loudly, but like the priests of Baal, there will be neither voice nor hearing. If, however, we so desire it, then the opposite will occur. And even before we can ask, we shall hear God say, I am here. See Isaiah 58, 9. These words mean, I am present, I am here with you. And we immediately turn our gaze toward God, who completely fills our vision and overwhelms us. If we desire to be so conquered by the Spirit, then we will truly be children of God. We will truly be able to say that we struggle truthfully and that our love for God is genuine. Otherwise, whatever the rest of the world is doing, 
that's what we'll be doing too.